Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Well, welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board budget meeting. Um, we are going to be reviewing um, sections of the proposed 2015-2016 school board budget. And since this is a finance-driven meeting, I'm turning the meeting over to our finance chair, Michael Moore. Thanks, Joe. Uh, <clears throat> uh, welcome to the uh, second budget workshop for the 2015-2016 school budget. I will quickly review the agenda for the workshop. Tonight we will review staffing, salaries and benefits, Cape Elizabeth High School, Cape Elizabeth Middle School, Pond Cove, and instructional support. Uh, if you're unable to stay for the whole meeting, all the budget workshops are videotaped. Uh, tonight's agenda will be as follows. First we, will mel uh, first, we will welcome public comments on the agenda items I just discussed. I ask that you limit your comments to uh, three minutes. This will ensure everyone has an opportunity to speak. Uh, we will initially allocate 30 minutes to public comments. If there's a need for more time, the board can extend that time. Following public comments, the superintendent will provide an overview of the budget, salaries and benefits and staffing, with building principals and administrators uh, presenting their departmental budgets and narratives. Uh, before we open up to public comment, I would like to share a section of the Cape School's mission and vision statement. I read the ethics portion of the Cape School's mission and vision statement last night. It says, we value decision making and actions guided by principles of personal integrity, empathy, responsibility, and respect for self and others. These are the ethics we hope our students will develop and nurture. Keeping in mind these ethics as we proceed, uh, should we be hard on the issues tonight? Absolutely. Should we be open to different views and perspectives, realizing that educating children can be challenging? Yes. Shall all of us here tonight proceed with a commitment to respectful and thoughtful dialogue? I believe we should and hope that we do. Uh, thank you, and I would like to open up the meeting for public comment. Uh, please introduce yourself and try to limit your comments to three minutes. This will ensure everyone has an opportunity to speak. For those new to the public comment format, if your comments include specific questions, hopefully they will be addressed later tonight in the workshop as we review the topics on the agenda. If you feel your questions were not addressed in the workshop discussions, that will follow public comment. Or if you need more information on an issue, please email the board or you can also go back and if you're unable to stay the whole time, uh, review the videotape of the budget workshop. So uh, please let's get started. Whoever would, uh, if there is uh, public comment, uh, please uh, step up to the podium and if you'd be kind, just introduce yourself and um, whoever wants to go first, feel free to start us off. Um, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Brooking, good evening. I am here tonight to share my concerns and questions I have as a parent of three children in the Cape Elizabeth School District. My intention for doing this is to be helpful and to be a responsible parent and district resident. I am concerned about the elimination of the special edu education teacher position. I understand it is currently a vacant spot as that teacher resigned in the fall. The superintendent has been quoted saying the responsibilities from this position have been absorbed by other staff. Are these the same staff who will be taking on the responsibilities of the instructional support director if the proposal to go half time is approved? <clears throat> As a very aware and involved parent in the school district, I can tell you with confidence that staff already have too many responsibilities and they are overworked and overstressed. I can also tell you from my experience that staff is having a hard time with follow-up and follow-through with programs and communication with parents. I have had a difficult time getting meetings with staff in a timely manner. Emails and phone calls often go unanswered and I often have to send follow-up inquiries. <coughs> it can be weeks, even months, before issues we have agreed to become applied. 
This level of communication has declined each year. These teachers, staff, educators, and providers need our support and not be made to take on even more responsibilities. Service providers and educators have also had to take on the additional role of being case managers, roles that many of them are not qualified for. And some, <coughs> excuse me, are constructing IEPs for children they don't teach or even see daily. I am aware of instances in which services are not being provided to students. Services that have been agreed to in an IEP meeting by a team and documented in the legal document of an IEP. This is a direct violation of our children's IEPs and it is breaking special ed law. This is what is happening currently with a full-time instructional support director. I also want to ask another question that many other parents might have. Where are the funds to hire a much needed full-time behaviorist? My son is being disciplined by the vice principal who follows the school-wide color-coded system designed for typical behavioral issues. My son is exhibiting, the behaviors my son are, is exhibiting are symptoms of his autism. He should be getting treatment, therapy, and following a behavior plan with a qualified behaviorist. Is that my three minutes? That was, I'm so sorry. I'm going to finish. To help reduce his behaviors not being disciplined. My daughter, who also has a diagnosis of autism, has been suffering with the symptoms of pica, a condition where a person will ingest non-food items. See, she is exhibiting this behavior at school. There is no behaviorist available to take data and address my daughter's behavior that can be dangerous and life-threatening. We have had full-time support in the past in the school district and it was working. My children were progressing. My children were safe. Explain to me the logic of the elimination or not adding on a behaviorist position. I want to discuss the possibility that all of these responsibilities and jobs being delegated to other staff and service providers is a factor in why staff morale is exceptionally low as shown in the recent employee survey report. A report that I am assuming all school members have seen. There has been a high turnover of staff in the last few years, especially in the instructional support department. Most of those positions were held by staff who were well regarded by their working peers, trusted and loved by parents, and had years of exceptional service with CAPE. These staff have all resigned, and I can be pretty confident when I say the resignations have been a direct result of the cuts, changes, and leadership in the instructional support department. Before I can support this proposed budget, I'm asking for additional and appropriate discussion time between administrators, school board members, and parents to address our many questions and rightful concerns. Thank you for allowing this, me this time to advocate for my children, the communi community of special education, and the amazing educators that work with my children, educators that we can't afford to lose any more of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening, my name is Bill Gross. I live at 7 Seaview Avenue. And uh, I'd like to start by saying that uh, I've sent an email in, or several emails, into Michael Moore, and he's been very helpful in answering my questions and, uh, and enlightening me on some of the things I didn't understand in the budget. Tonight I want to talk about just three things on the budget. Uh, the first is the, uh, the, the social work guidance expenses that are shown in the budget. I went through it. And under the individual budgets for Pond Cove Middle School and the High School, uh, guidance slash social work totals six hundred and forty-seven thousand one hundred and twenty-nine dollars. And then in the instructional support portion of the budget, uh, for the K through eight uh, section of that, the social workers, psychology, speech and language, and occupational therapy total $476,791. And in the instructional support uh, for 9 through 12, the social work, psychology, speech, language, and occupational therapy total $232,168. The total for all three sections of the budget are $1,356,088. Now this seems 
awfully high for social work therapy type of, of an expense because obviously none of these dollars are doing anything as far as uh, direct and uh, doing nothing directly to improve the reading level and math ability of our students. And during, when the school board is going through this budget, it would be helpful to me if they could uh, explain the relationship. Number one, some of these I suspect are required by law and are not optional. And, and I'd, like, I'd like to have that pointed out when you go through the budget. And secondly, if there's any way you can relate the dollars we spend on social work guidance and these various, various types of therapies and the <coughs> improvement in the educational performances of the students, then it would be easier to swallow $1,300,000 in tax money going for them. The second point I want to talk about is the, the uh, volunteer coordinator uh, position. This year the volunteer coordinator is retiring and it seems to me this would be an opportune time to take a look at the position and see if we can eliminate it. In the budget there's a total of $67,206 for the volunteer coordinator position and I believe there would also be some, uh, uh, some of the duties will be slightly expanded for that position. Now I'm a volunteer, I've been volunteering here in Cape Elizabeth for five years uh, uh, as a physics tutor. And I want to share with you my schedule this week as a volunteer. And, and, and this will help explain why I don't believe we really need this position. So today in the high school, during period six, I tutored two uh, ninth graders in honors physics. And in period seven, I tutored one senior in AP physical calculus. Tomorrow, during period four, I'll be tutoring one student in a fr in on on ninth grader in honors physics, and in period eight, two ninth graders in honors physics, and in period six, three ninth graders in honor honors physics. And on Thursday, I'll be uh, period four, I'll be tutoring one ninth grader in honors physics, and in period seven, I'll be tutoring one twelfth grader in AP physical calculus, and in eighth period, I'll be tutoring one ninth grader in honors physics. Now all these students, have, I'm tutoring them when they're having their uh, study periods. And all of the scheduling is done by myself and the uh, physics teachers and sometimes a, a guidance counselor who would refer <coughs> a student to me. I, it's my responsibility to go out and find a classroom. If the physics classroom is empty during a student's study period, I use the physics classroom. If it's not, I go out and find another room down the hall or use the Achievement Center. Now, the point I'm making is I do all of this on my own. In, in five years of volunteering, I've met with the, the, co fit, the volunteer coordinator one time. The first meeting when I had to go to the class where they tell me any information I learned about the student is private and I can't share it with anyone. So for five years, I've been doing this type of work. I suspect I'm doing more coordinating, scheduling, and, and uh, spending more hours volunteering. And all of this is volunteering. I'm a tutor, but I don't charge anything for it. Bill. I'm 100% of a volunteer. So, so Bill, I don't want to, I want to give you enough time maybe just to talk on point three, and then we okay. want to make sure there's enough opportunities. All right, so but if, first of all, thank you so much for volunteering. Well, you're welcome. Um, my, my only point is if I can do all this without a volunteer coordinator, I expect all the other many volunteers we have in the school system can do the same thing without, without a volunteer uh, coordinator. If you could briefly hit point briefly, three. my last point. Oh, actually, the, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll skip the last one because it would take a little bit more time and I'll leave time for other people to speak. Thank you, Bill. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is John Volz and I have a parent of a child who in the Pine Cove and at the middle school. Um, and I'm here also to speak again about the instructional support budget. I gotta say, when I looked at the overall budget, if I were sitting in your shoes, uh, I was a little bit surprised because I read over the budget summary and it didn't seem to make sense to me because there were a few changes called out. In, in fact, you sort of looked at the overall level of what the student population is and how it's stabilizing, going down a little bit. And there was a lot of ink to basically looking to eliminate a half a teacher position uh, at the high school. And then when I looked at the instructional support budget and looked at what's going on there, um, <coughs> it didn't seem to make sense. I, as I look at it, as I saw the budget, overall it's going up a few percent. And then if, uh, if you actually account for the the significant reduction in debt service of about half a million dollars is going up about 1.1 million on a baseline. Overall, so over, overall everything's rising about 
uh, in, the, in the total budget from last year, including the debt service. And you've got the student populations going down by about 2.8% or something like that. Um, and the budget's going up a little bit. But when you look at the instructional support in the special ed uh, segment of the budget, the population is dropping by about 4%, few, a few students. But the reduction seems to be uh, drastically not commensurate with that same percentage drop. And there's no background and no data that says, number one, we think we already are doing a sufficient job. So even holding it even is the right number. But it's a significantly lower number than in an overall rising budget. It stands out to me like a sore thumb, and I don't understand it. And I want to know that you guys understand the data and the performance that backs that up. And then I'd like to say a little bit of word to put special education a little bit in context. Uh, I had my son in special education for a, a long time now, and one of the things that I learned is it's not just about those 150 kids who are in special education. And to view it that way is really missing the point, because I know that some of the things, the supports that were put in place specifically for him as required in his IEP helped a lot of other students in his class. A very simple example when he was in kindergarten in a different state. They just put up a written guideline for this is the schedule for the day. And help many, many other students know what's coming next, help with the transitions, and all of that added to the learning. So if you're viewing this just as those 150 kids, you're missing the boat. It's really about the entire learning environment. And I would say, I looked at this and, I'm th and I know, I feel like the the staff that we're having now, similarly, they don't have the time to respond to things appropriately and follow up on things appropriately. And seeing further reductions in the feet on the ground who have to service this, that is far beyond the reduction in the population, uh, concerns me greatly. And I would also say, this is one of those things where everybody is a hero cutting costs in the short term. But this one's a little bit more like aircraft maintenance. You know, we didn't rehire the guy who de-iced the planes. And we saved a lot of money in the short run. But guess what? When there's a problem, it's a big one and it's expensive. So I would urge that you get the data that supports this drop in the budget in an overall perspective of a rising budget and a small drop in student population. I don't feel the data that I've seen supports that. And, I, and when it comes time to the re, for the final review, I will expect to know that you have seen that and reviewed it thoroughly. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Michelle Kane, and I have three boys in the Cape School System, two at Middle oops, and one in Palm Cove. Um, and I did email the board and the superintendent a detailed letter today regarding the proposed cuts to the special support program. Three minutes isn't enough time to go through everything, so I would appreciate if somebody would respond to the questions that I don't, that aren't hit tonight, um, to me. That would be wonderful. Um, I want to thank you all for providing all the detailed information on the website. It was very helpful. Um, and I call, um, I'm just going to call instructional support IS to make it quicker. But IS students are a minority in our, in our schools, um, but all students are impacted by IS cuts, as my predecessor just said. Um, and our school budget should be focused on all of our students and ensuring that their needs are met. I have three points I'd like to address. First, the projected 4% decrease in students in the IS program, approximately five students. And I want to ask how that justifies reducing the IS director position from full-time to part-time and eliminating an IS teacher and ed tech position. Um, this should not be about the numbers of students, but about their needs. Numbers are numbers. I mean, the numbers don't justify it anyway, I don't think. But what are the needs of the students in our district? How many services does each child in instructional support get? How many hours do they deserve? Um, have, you have you considered each IEP? in proposing these staff reductions? And is it conceivable at all that their needs could be met? 
with these cuts. Absorbing the duties of a IS teacher and an ed tech has not been successful in my experience, um, particularly this past year. Um, we need a full-time behaviorist to properly develop, adjust, and monitor our children's plans um, to meet their needs uh, so they don't fall behind academically, socially, um, emotionally. Um, some of our children in IS, I can't remember, but yeah, um, help academically raise our scores. You know, I don't like that whole, I didn't like that argument, sorry. But um, a lot of, you know, our students, they're different. Um, but not less. Thank you. Um, and we just don't want them to fall behind the existing staff and administration that are already being asked to absorb the duties of those two positions. Um, it's not working well. They're overworked, uh, and they're not meeting um, the needs uh, of our students. And I'm wondering, just who benefits from reducing this director position to part time? I don't see the students, the staff, the administrators, anybody benefiting. Um, so I'm, I, I'm just trying to figure out where this is coming from. And please consider the vast impl implications in other places if we do cut this posi these positions, including the director in half and the teacher in that tech. Our principals and our staff um, aren't all trained um, and experienced IS directors or behaviorists. Uh, Second, I'd like to address the dollar amounts involved and offer some alternative solutions, options to reducing our budget without negatively impacting our IS um, budget. The school website indicates that the proposed budget cut to IS staff is $129,174. That makes up 80% of the total staff cuts in all of our schools. I want to know how this will benefit the IS students, the staff, and the administration, and the entire Cape School population. And I'm praying that these cuts can be made elsewhere or taken from our, um, oh my God, what is that budget? What is it called now? I can't remember. Um, please consider instead cutting perhaps the $35,000 HR generalist position. That really is a position that benefits the town, not the students. Um, doesn't have a direct impact on our students, and I feel like it should be a town expense. Second, um, this $30,000 innovation scheme budget. Uh, I, don't, I just don't see how this is necessary. Teachers in the past, if they have ideas, they can apply for grants. Um, and I just don't see how this has a direct impact on our students and, you know, who it benefits. Um, it's just a lot of money <coughs> for that. Um, third is redesigning the school website for 20 grand. To me, that seems... Um, like it wouldn't have a direct impact on our students. The website's working fine, in my opinion. Um, it worked great to prepare for this meeting. And um, maybe they could apply for a receipt grant if they want to improve it. Or maybe we have somebody in our community who knows how to do this and would volunteer their time or at free or at a reduced cost. Um, so that's the money. Third, I just ask that you consider our staff and administration um, in all these decisions. Um, you know, four years ago we went through this. A significant number of ed techs were eliminated and supposed to be replaced by teacher positions. Um, and we had these four teacher positions put in place and a consultant. And I have no idea where those, where those are now. They seem to be, they seem to have vanished. Um, and the behaviorist, we had, I think we have a full-time behaviorist that's supposed to be on staff, but she's out on maternity leave and she hasn't been here all year and there's been no replacement. And then over the past couple weeks, they hired a consultant who I believe is gonna be in the school for three hours a week. She also has a full-time job um, elsewhere. And I do not see how that's gonna meet the needs of our 156, 150 plus um, instructional support students. They need to be, a behaviorist needs to be in the classroom or meet with the students, get to know the students. Um, spend time with them, work with their team, gain an understanding of what's needed to help them. Um, these kids, they're all so different. Um, and we, I just would like the staffing decisions to be based on the students' needs, not just numbers, and consider the staff and administration when you make the decisions. I feel like they're overworked, and I want them to stay. They're phenomenal. Um, I want to improve their morale. I want to reduce their workload. 
I don't want them looking for employment elsewhere. Um, also, we have to consider how we're going to attract any new, innovative, um, talented staff to come to Cape with the continuing elimination of um, IS positions. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you, you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Hello everybody, my name is Jeannie Steinus, I live on Cross Hill, and uh, I'm here in reference to my grandson, he is a child with autism, he's in the third grade, his mom and his brother uh, live with me, and I am just tired of hearing of cutting stuff for children with special needs. I know a few people have a problem with this, but I do. I mean, these children need help. And the cutting here, cutting there, I mean, last year you took bus number five. That was, an, an, that was a big cut right there. Nobody, um, that was a last minute, bus number five was cut that picked up all the children with special needs. Now, my grandson goes to school, and how he goes to school, I drive him to school and I pick him up. I'm not a bus. And then I asked, what if it, in case of an emergency, that I can't bring him to school, what happens then? And I was told that we have to give a week's notice. I didn't, I didn't know that an emergency concerns a week's notice. Does that make sense to you? An emergency is an emergency. So it's a good thing my car is working fine, but I mean, and bus number six, and they told me they needed um, to put a net tech on bus number six, that's the week's notice, so they can get a net tech on bus number six, so he would have to take bus number six. Well, bus number six has a fantastic driver, from what I understand. Has two kids on there that I can tell you are bullies, other kids. I refuse to put my grandson on that bus. And the thing is, I don't think of an ed tech would be able to be that protective over bullying. And children with special need have a problem with loud noise. And I hear the bus coming from way down the street with all the kids screaming and hollering. Can you imagine children with disability on that bus? That is not, that's not adequate at all. So, I mean, you guys have been cutting this, cutting that, cutting. I am tired of the cutting. We had a, a principal, Tom, which you all know him, I'm sure. He was a principal here at Pond Cole for many years. He never had an assistant principal. He was able to manage a job by himself and did a fantastic job from what I understand. Now, no offense to the assistant principal, but the thing is, I don't see that we need an assistant principal. That would be a nice big cut from the budget, right there. Because the thing is, there's not that much work to be done where a principal cannot do it herself. So that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Whalen, and uh, I have two daughters in the school system, one in uh, seventh grade and one in third grade. And what I'd like to address is my uh, daughter who's in third grade, who is, uh, you know, uh, in special education, special needs. And um, my remarks aren't as specific. I would have been more specific, but I think most of that has been covered. One of my biggest concerns is that we were promised three years ago that one of our one of the big concerns of the parents at the time was communication and poor communication between the school system and what was happening and the parents and we were told that the parents would have more involvement and that just hasn't happened i mean if if i didn't hear by an email i wouldn't even have known to come to this meeting that this would have been open i think the communication has actually gone away from as, as poor as it was three years ago, it's actually decreased. Uh, a couple points in, in terms of communication. You know, when we look at what is being cut, 
my questions are, why is it being cut? Who decides what is being cut? I mean, ultimately, not the person that decides, all right, we're going to take a red, red pen and cross that out. But what's the thought process? Is it research-based? Are there interviews? Are parents involved? You know, do they say, you know, a behaviorist is not necessary because of what? Is that based on state research, national research? None of that stuff is communicated. I'll give you a simple example. And uh, on Fridays, my daughter would swim every Friday afternoon. And that just went away. And my daughter would wake up in the morning and say, every day she wakes up, she says, what day is it? And it, when we said Friday, she said, oh, I have swimming today. Well, swimming just went away. And no one ever explained why it went away. And I can't see any cost associated to that. And I understand there's concern, you know, that, that budgets are a reality, that things will be cut. But I just like more communication on why. And if the school board and beyond know the impact that those cuts would have. Now, I do applaud the 50% reduction in the director position. You know, all right, if we're going to eliminate the 50%, you know, but, but why does that money come out of the budget? When you make a decision like that, shouldn't that money reach? Stay in the budget to, you know, to the people that are that are really doing the work every day. Shouldn't that get reallocated for that? That's that kind of that's when a decision like that, when that's made, it should be reallocated to the people who are doing the work. Now I see some of the people who have actually worked with both of my daughters here, and they work really hard. And I just like to end by saying, if you if if you want to spend a couple hours getting to understand what their day is like, you know, go in there and you'll see how difficult it is. You know, and they make my job at home a lot easier because they, they're doing all the hard work all day long. Um, and again, most of, the, most of the things that, the specific things have been said, but I just like, you know, to, to end where I began in that the communication, I would just appreciate the communication on what's happening. That's what we were promised. We were promised communication on strategy, on personnel, on all of those decisions going forward, and we just haven't heard it. And, and as you know, when communication is lacking, it creates a vacuum. And so you get rumor. You get, you know, almost paranoia. Things are going to happen. This is going to happen. <coughs> and then the communication is, you know, miscommunication, which leads to a lot of angst and, and a decrease in morale. So, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Hi, my name is um, Michelle Ashore, and I have a daughter in fifth grade and has special needs. And I'm going to be brief. I just have two questions, and I really do my homework as well as all these people there. So, um, <clears throat> my, um, my first one, and I think it might have been addressed in the last meeting, but if you could read, kind of go over where this half position salary is going to be allocated to. And um, I, don't, I think I had a couple different versions on where that was going, so that would be great to hear that. And um, my second concern would be, you know, we're talking about a lot of cuts and stuff, but I think we also need to focus on what we actually have right now. And my biggest concern would be, at, it's my understanding that we have a salaried OT position that's supposed to be here four times, I mean five days a week, and is, is only here four because they're being allocated in a Portland school that has nothing to do with CAPE students. It's kind of an area of concern for me, and I think I'm hearing that there's actually a speech therapist that might be doing that as well. So that's kind of, that would be my second concern. I'd just like to be um, talked about if we could. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Deb Patry. I have uh, two boys in the um, school system, one in third grade um, and one in fifth grade. Um, the one in fifth grade has an IEP, and um, we've been here for five years, six years, I guess, including kindergarten. Um, and it's just felt like a slow erosion of services over time. Um, I felt like it was a rich program when we showed up, and then um, it's just been downhill from there. Um, I, the people who work with uh, my son on a daily basis are fantastic, but they're overworked. Um, and to say that it's okay for them to absorb that one teacher's instructional support teacher's position and be okay with that, I think is absurd um, because what that person did before them um, was amazing and brought a lot to our um, instructional support system as a whole. Um, 
and it, the numbers just don't make sense like um, other people here have, have mentioned. Um, the percent decline in the population of, of kids with needs um, does not correlate with the percent increase in um, cuts. Um, and so I ask that you reconsider um, some of your options. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marcia Chase, and I teach um, French and Spanish at Pond Cove Elementary School. Uh, I'm here just to make the public aware of cuts that have been made to the World Language Program over the past several years. We have indeed extended instruction to first grade, but it's been done at a time when there's been a reduction in staffing. The history of our staffing is that in the 2013 to 14 school year, we had six full-time teachers at Pond Cove, between Pond Cove and the middle school. The year after that, 2013 to 14, we had our position, uh, the staffing decreased by half position, but a full grade level of teaching responsibilities was added. This year, we have had, we are still at 5.5 teachers, <coughs> but yet another grade level has been added, first grade. So we have indeed extended world language to the younger grades, and that is wonderful. However, it's done, and we really need more staffing, for, uh, and more funding for staffing in order for the program to have the impact that we hope we would hope it would have on language competency. Currently, um, I teach at Pond Cove. I teach close to 500 students. I am a traveling teacher. I teach eight classes a day, um, and I move between um, among 23 classrooms in a week. Um, what this means when instruction is stretched over a large number of students is that the contact time is reduced. And this is key to language proficiency, which is one of our goals. Um, in first grade currently, um, due to many factors, we have two 15-minute classes which meet over mm -hmm. the course of six days. Which is, it's great, but it's not the contact time that really studies show children need. No matter how young a student is, it's not magic. Um, if we were talking about true <coughs> language immersion, where there is contact every day for a number of hours, that's when young children really can benefit. But two 15-minute meetings over the course of a six-day uh, schedule is, is uh, not sufficient, in my view, to really achieve the goals that, that we need. Um, and this has happened really across the board. Uh, in the past, we had had at least three contact times in a five-day schedule uh, for grades two, uh, three and four. All of that has been reduced to two contact times over a six-day schedule. Um, with snow days and other interruptions and things of that sort, we also had makeup days in the past. That's not possible because of the tight teacher scheduling. So days that are lost are simply lost. Um, I calculated by counting the number of hours I used to see students. We've gone from about 32 hours of instructional time for students at Pond Cove in the course of a year to perhaps 25. It's significant. So you can imagine that's the course over an entire year to really accomplish quite a daunting curriculum. Um, so that's... Um, I figure, you know, it's a reduction of about a quarter to a third mm -hmm. instruction time. Um, the foundation of language proficiency is daily contact. So the best scenario, I would say, is at least to move back to staffing that would provide for three contact times in a five-day period. Um, and uh, this is not what an immersion program, an immersion program is meeting every single day. So even if we were to do um, language entirely in the language, it's still not sufficient for children to really gain, make the gains that we're hoping they
you should make. Um, this is based on research that comes in national standards that come out of, um, uh, come to us showing that what PLUS programs, which is what we have here in Cape, should be a minimum of three contact times in five days, 90 minutes a week, minimum, for minimum competency. And we are looking at um, almost high intermediate proficiency for our students. So time, it's all about time. We have the program, but we, the time is not with it built into it. We need more staffing. Thank you, Marsha. My voice is a little weak. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Rosemary Ginn, and I'm a literacy specialist at Pond Cove. And tonight I'm here to represent the staff of Pond Cove. Um, Kelly and Julie, a couple months ago, gave the staff an opportunity to talk about the culture in our school. And we had more than one meeting to discuss what was positive and what our challenges were. And from those meetings, we've created a moving forward team and trying to address the culture within our schools. As a result of those meetings, uh, the staff gave to me and to a couple other representatives a very long list of their concerns. And what I did and it took many hours, not that I need saying that, but I think it's important to understand the hours that it took for me to collate all of their comments into some kind of working document. And we created or this document called What is Getting in the Way of Effectiveness and Impact with Students? And so when Meredith came to meet with us, we presented her with this document, of which I have copies, if any of you would like to see it. And we talked about what we felt were challenges within our school. And the one that, there were three, but the one that I want to refer to tonight is the second one that we had, and that was reduction in critical staffing. And for us at Pond Cove, the reduction of the behavior strategist has had a huge impact on all of us, regular education staff and special education staff. We wrote that the impact was that special education and regular education teachers are trying to provide appropriate behavioral interventions without adequate behavioral training, experience, or background. Students with significant emotional and behavioral needs do not have a behavior strategist working consistently and directly with them. There is less time for targeted instruction and monitoring progress toward IEP goals, as well as regular education student goals. Educational support teachers and staff are often pulled to handle a behavior, for example, or to monitor a child on the playground. The second staffing that we were concerned about was the Pond Cove Special Education Strategist. We felt that the impact are that our special educators in our building are spending many extra hours beyond their working day on IEP administration, paperwork, and documentation. So they have little time to meet or train with the current ed techs. Then our third concern was over ed techs. The impact from the input from the staff was that highly qualified teachers are spending hours each week on the playground, lunchroom, bus duties, copying materials, and they have far less time to focus on teaching, implementing initiatives, collaboration, and professional conversations because the ed techs are often pulled to cover teachers during IEPs or they're pulled for this, and the whole process becomes very challenging. But one of our greatest concerns is over the RTI implementation. We feel very strongly that to meet the needs of our 
changing demographics and the challenging learning and behavior concerns, we requested that we have an ed tech per grade level to help provide with tier two support because the specialists that people often refer to in our schools are providing tier three with more and more one-on-one -on -one students because their needs are so significant. But also within RTI is the behavior strategies reduces our ability to fully implement because in RTI there's a whole piece that's dedicated to behavior, tier one, tier two, tier three, and that's become increasingly more difficult for us to address. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say is there have been no conversations around the impact the district decisions have on the time and effort that people have made to strengthen our schools and provide for our students. People feel that what they have done does not matter or is valued. These staffing reductions reinforce this. Over the last few years, each budget round brings further reduction in staffing and resources. Numbers do not tell the whole picture of the demands on staff and the impact on students. When numbers dictate decisions, people lose faith and trust that what they've spent years building is no longer valued. Putting money into new initiatives without any conversation to what people believe is important or needed further reinforces the lack of trust and belief that their expertise is valued. Cape Elizabeth has the capacity for excellence. If this path of reduction continues, it will be hard to close the achievement gap and achieve that level of excellence. We encourage you to look beyond the numbers and to invest in our student needs, ensuring their achievement and success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've gone almost about 45 minutes. Maybe we'll have uh, opportunity for if there's one last. Um, I think I saw someone that wanted to speak, so we don't want to cut anybody off who was in, in the lineup. So. When my son, <coughs> who's now in third grade, first started at, can you? Could you introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Yes. My name Thank is Audra you. Welton. And when my son first started at Uncle, he was part of a program that allowed him to learn French five days a week. And it was a highlight for him. And it was an area that he excelled in. Reading was a bit of a challenge. Writing was a bit of a challenge. Math was a bit of a challenge. But language really came to him and it gave him confidence. And at home, he was speaking in French. And um, thankfully, I know a little bit. And so it increased his confidence. And you know, this year, he came home. There were two things that he cried about most every night. And one was French. Guess it's not my thing anymore. Like, he didn't understand why he wasn't allowed to have French five days a week or three days a week anymore. <coughs> Why could he not do that? And the other thing he cried about was why could he not eat snack with his class? It took him over a month to be able to verbalize what was going on. And then I pursued with emails and calls, trying to understand what is my child talking about, not able to eat snack with his classmates. And that's when I found out that in order to receive his instructional support, the schedule was requiring that he be pulled out of snack time. He was still eating snack in the hallway. I want to encourage these decisions about the budget to be made on facts. There needs to be an internal audit on the actual facts of how these IEPs are being and not being, like I truly believe that there are more violations going on than you realize. So once I found out that he had been eating every single day in the hallway not to receive services, it wasn't to receive services, it was because of the way the schedule went. I got the runaround for additional weeks and months. 
he only just recently has been changed so that the three kids, he wasn't the only one, three children alone in the hallway with an adult. It, I, it boggles my mind. I'm new to this. I'm new to the IEP. It took us a little while to realize that, that my son needed one and that that would be what could help with his reading and writing. And I'm so thankful for the people who work with him directly. I see overstretched. I see lack of communication as something as basic as what is my son's schedule. That is unacceptable. So I'm new to this, and I, I please hope that you would base this on facts. Do an internal audit, be honest. You will find there's way more there that is positive and that is very horrifying that's happening right here in our school system. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll um, close the uh, public comment. Um, but like I said initially, um, you know, we'll be here probably for another you know two and a half hours. So if you have um, a question and uh, you're not able to stay and uh, hear us discuss it, you know, please contact the school board. Um, the, the the video is available online for tonight and ultimately. Um, feel free to reach out and email us um, and we'll follow up um, as we do to all emails we receive regarding um, inquiries uh, or contact with the school board. So um, <clears throat> we'll move now. The superintendent will review the um, main drivers of the salary and benefits and then we'll move into a narrative presentation by uh, building principals and administrators. Thank you, Michael. Um, so here in person last week, I'll just sort of start at the top um, by indicating that the total expenditure increase for the budget is a total of 2.6%. Um, of that, that's a net tax of 1.5%, which for a $314,000 home is an increase of 0.7% on taxes or $0.12 cents per $1,000 of value evaluation. Um, you know, as we look at the overall increases, Salaries and benefits is a $716,624 increase, or 3.9% increase over last year. Um, for our teacher um, salaries, that represents a 2.5% increase in their base rate of pay, um, driven by the collective bargaining agreement, as well as um, steps for um, teachers and lane changes as appropriate. Um, in addition, we've budgeted an 8% increase in health insurance benefits. We don't know those numbers typically at this time of year. We often don't find those out until late April. Um, and the range can vary considerably. Um, I think the top percentage increase for districts across the state last year was roughly 13%. Uh, we've also seen an increase in retirement benefits. The state cost for retirement increased from 2.65% um, to 3.36%, so our district's contribution to state employee retirement has increased by that amount. Um, you'll also remember that we experienced a couple of years ago a cost shift in um, teacher retirement, which previously was funded entirely at the state level, and those funds moved into the local district. And that percentage, um, as our salaries have increased, that cost to us has increased as well. Um, so that represents roughly, um, the benefits piece is roughly um, about $225,000 of that total increase of the $700,000. Um, so shifting to the proposed staffing changes, and we'll talk about these in more detail um, sort of by building, but based on enrollment, we proposed a reduction in staffing of one teacher at Pond Cove. Um, as well as a reduction in staffing of one teacher at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. We'll talk about preschool staffing, I think, when we talk about instructional support at the end of the evening. Um, we've proposed an increase for a drama um, teacher position at Cape Elizabeth High School. As noted and discussed earlier, and again, we'll return to this at the end of the meeting, um, a reduction of one teacher and one educational technician in instructional support an increase of a 0.2 um, gifted and talented teacher. So that's the first time that will have appeared in our local budget. That's a new um, program for us. Last year, we funded summer school salaries entirely out of um, carryover funds from last year. So again, summer school salaries are a first time um, addition to our budget. 
Again, as mentioned earlier, there's a um, half-time human resources specialist position that will be shared with the town, and we'll, again, we'll go into detail about all of these, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but just to give the broad <coughs> um, We reduced, um, as Mr. Gross pointed out, the volunteer services coordinator position, but we have expanded the responsibilities of that job um, in accordance with the strategic plan, and it, the position proposed is a volunteer and extended learning opportunity coordinator position. We proposed a reduction of the half-time um, administrative support person who works with our nurses in the health offices and the half-time reduction in the director of inspectional support position. Um, so the total um, change in those reductions for salaries is a decrease of $151,000 or a decrease of three and a half positions over current year budget. And the details of those are sort of laid out um, on the next page in your binder, and you can follow along sort of the historical um, staffing numbers if, if there are questions about those pieces. Um, just want to point out, and I know there are a number of questions, and so we'll, we'll return to this along, along the way and throughout the evening, I'm sure. Um, there was one question about instructional support in terms of the overall increase. Um, the special education budget overall staffing salaries and benefits for next year is $4,932,007. That represents actually a net increase of $7,780. So despite the fact that there are some reductions, there are increases in that budget um, overall. So I think... We're going to transition to the high school. Yes, um, thank you for going through the staffing changes. The thought is when we have uh, building principals, we'll go through their narrative uh, to give us a context for um, you know some of these changes. So uh, hopefully the most efficient format would be, I believe Jeff is gonna present the high school. So if the board would be willing to let him go through his narrative and discuss some of the changes and then after he's done with that, we could, uh, you know, ask questions. Um, and that way, given we tend to ask a lot of questions, that'll at least give the administration opportunities to go through um, their narratives. And then we can ask questions and then go through the non-salaries portion uh, of the budget, which is included um, under the, uh, the tabs in the binder. So, Jeff, you can have the floor. Sure, thank you. Um, and I'm not going to hit a lot of the things in the budget. I think a lot of them are self-explanatory. Just to spend a few minutes hitting what I think are a few highlights. Um, and then I've gotten a few questions from Meredith over the past couple of days. And I'm going to try to hit, hit hopefully all of those uh, to some extent. Um, and then whatever questions board members have now would be great. But, um, I don't have a long presentation. I would just say that um, I, in, on the non-salary side of the high school budget, um, the proposal is, is, to, is a net increase of $33,238. Um, again, that's the non-salary side of the budget, a proposed increase of $33,238, of which the two major drivers of that total non-salaries and benefits increase is um, the cost of send the increased numbers of students who are going to the Portland Arts and Technology High School or paths. Um, so of that total, 33,200 roughly, um, of just a shade over $14,500 <coughs> is due to an increase in the PAS expenditures, which is a result of the formula that PATHS uses to allocate their costs among the various sending schools. <coughs> um, the other biggest driver of the $33,238 in non-salaries increase is, uh, is a one-time charge for next year uh, related um, to our New England Association of Schools and Colleges accreditation visit, which is going to be happening in just a, about a year from now. Um, so a, a team of 15 educators comes to Cape Elizabeth, looks at our schools, looks at our self-study report that we're in the middle of preparing this year, um, arrives at its own conclusions, um, and the costs for that are primarily, or, or the new costs for that, are primarily around housing and, and feeding, the members of that team. 
Um, so the cost for that is $13,400. Again, that is a once in every 10 years cost that high schools bear. Um, it's actually, I think, a pretty modest expense compared to what I've seen with some visiting teams, and that really is in large part due to the generosity of the Inn by the Sea in, in being willing to give us our team. Um, Fortunately, it's mud season from their standpoint, so there's probably some advantage to them, but um, they've been willing to give us some substantial discounts. Um, so the balance of the increase on the non-salary non side is a total um, in the high school of $5,311. Uh, it's spread around in different bits and pieces here and there, um, and I thought what I would do is just highlight a few things. Um, um, so if you turn beyond my narrative, or beyond the high school narrative, um, and these may not be in order, but I'll try to, um, on the first page of the high school narrative, uh, the high school spreadsheet, I'm sorry, um, there's a, there are two lines for high school instructional technology. Um, and you'll see one of those lines um, has an increase that an, a, as a percentage basis is a significant increase. Um, what the real dollar increase is is $5,345 for software. <coughs> um, that is um, attributable to two purchases that are proposed and one is um, for $500 to support our AP calculus students. Um, and the other one is to purchase AutoCAD software as, as we evolve our drafting program from um, uh, hands, I'm not sure what you call it. Uh, uh, manual. Manual, manual system of drafting to a more computer-based system. Mm -hmm. um, and that cost for that, that AutoCAD software is $4,195. Um, there are a number of um, increases that, again, on a percentage basis, um, if not on an absolute dollar basis, are a little higher, and mm -hmm. so the board may have some questions about them. There are a few in the library lines, which are also on the first page of the high school spreadsheet. Um, so, for example, there's a, a $2,000 increase for electronic database subscriptions. Um, I, I can give the board any details beyond what I'm going to tell you right now, that, but that's largely to support the um, policy projects that students do in World History II as sophomores, um, and it's to purchase some, some specialized databases around history topics and current events and world issues topics. Um, there's a couple of different um, subscriptions that uh, Carolyn, who's the librarian, Librarian and Learning Center specialist here is proposing. Um, there's a books and periodicals increase, again, of $2,000 that on a percentage basis, it's a little higher than, than some other lines. Um, on an absolute dollars basis, it's $2,000 in the budget. Um, and that is to fund the purchase of a program called Overdrive. Um, thank you, because we're getting verification from Ruth Ruth Allen, who knows the budget and this side of it just as well, if not better than I do. Uh, but Overdrive allows students access to ebooks um, and various electronic digital media um, for books and magazines and those sorts of things. Um, so there's those couple of things. Um, and really, that's about it. One other item that I did um, highlight, well, I'll get to textbooks because David had a number of questions about textbooks. And I'll, I don't have all the information, but I can get all the information about the textbook specifics. But there was one other sort of one-time item uh, related to our ceramics room, uh, which is the replacement of a small kiln. We have a large kiln to support our ceramics program and a small kiln. Um, and the small kiln has reached the point that cars tend to reach where you pour a lot of money into it to keep it going, and after a while it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so there's a one-time purchase of just about $2,300 uh, for the small kiln. So now what I thought I would do is turn to some specific questions that I have. And I don't have all the answers to the questions, but I'll at least touch on them. Um, and then the ones that I, I have to gather a little bit of information for, I'll get those to you. Um, around high school textbooks, that's the area I didn't get this question until fairly late today, so by that time, some of the teachers who can provide... It was my fault, Jeff. Yeah, that's okay. I'm not quite... But 
I, I can easily get that information, that's fine. But I do have the numbers in terms of the specific uh, textbook selections um, that I highlighted in the budget. There's a proposal to replace the AP statistics te textbook. The total um, for re that replacement is $9,030. Uh, there's a proposal to replace honors bio textbooks, honors biology textbooks for 11th graders. The total of that purchase is, is $8,890. Um, and there's a proposal to replace, to begin the replacement uh, of our honors U.S. history textbooks, and that's for a total of $6,175. Um, I don't have the specifics of the age of those textbooks and that sort of stuff. I can easily get that within the next day or two. I will say typically we don't replace books unless they're at least five years old. Typically they're significantly older than that, but I have to get the specifics about the, these specific texts, um, and I certainly will do that. Um, Okay, um, so I'm just going to go through some, there were a couple of sets of questions that came across um, and, and a number of questions about, that I think indirectly relate to the proposed reduction in the, the half-time um, administrative secretarial position to support the school nurses district-wide. That person um, is housed in the high school for most of her time, uh, but it is a district-wide position. Um, the work of, you know, a couple of years ago, we did reduce um, uh, that full-time position to a half-time position. Um, and then we recently reduced another position because um, there, used, there used to be a, I'm not going to get, there was another secretarial position that was reduced as well. I would say that we are functioning, we're functioning well now. Um, I would say there may be some capacity to absorb some some uh, uh, some of the loss if, if for the half time nurses position. What we have to do, and I've, I'm starting to meet with some of the guidance staff next week to look at sort of how the the somewhat slow times in guidance correspond to the times um, when there's a particular demand in the nurses office. So I have I have some thinking to do and some examination to do around that topic. Um, to that for a minute, Jeff, as well, because I did meet with our nurses. Yes. Just to address the district-wide piece of that, I did meet with our nurses today um, to discuss their concerns a little bit around this issue. And, and some of the concerns were around, gosh, you know, we've really relied on that person when we've been in the midst of screening. So we talked about some options for um, how to address screening time. For example, bringing in substitutes. We've increased our substitute nurse pool considerably over the last couple of years. Um, and having a substitute available so that they are freed up to concentrate on the screening was one of the options that we discussed. Um, they discussed concerns about some of the data entry and peak times. For example, at the elementary school, that's around when you have kindergarten registration and you're inputting all the new health forms for those incoming students. Um, screening times and at the high school around sort of the athletic um, time periods when all those health forms for athletic participation are due. So uh, we had a good conversation about those options. Um, you know, I, I think I've heard um, from building administrators generally that they feel that there's some capacity to potentially absorb some of those pieces, including um, ordering of supplies, which is one of the concerns that um, was raised as well. Um, and that, you know, I, I think reasonably with some substitute support and some coordination, we should be able to address most of those concerns, but we'll be continuing to look at it as we, as we look through the process. Um, so another question that came to me from a board member is, uh, Essentially, whether the reduction, the proposed reduction in the half-time administrative support position connected to the health offices in the, in the three schools will re result in a concern about harming the most vulnerable population. And I, mean, I can't predict exactly what public's, public outcry there might be, but I wouldn't think so because my, my understanding of the context, my recollection of the context for that concern a couple of years ago when it was about replacing uh, a, a fully licensed school nurse with a paraprofessional. And this is a quite different, I think the concern will be more along the lines of what Meredith has mentioned, which is around keeping up with a lot of the records, the inputting, the screening, the data, um, and that sort of stuff. And I don't mean to suggest that that's not important. It is critically important, and it's, some of it is very time dependent and that sort of thing. But I think it's a pretty different issue that, that the board is facing now with that one. Um, 
There was, there is a question about how many foreign students, which I, I, I took, took to mean exchange students, how many exchange students we have each year. Um, typically, we allow up to four students, um, four exchange students in the high school. Um, it's very much dependent, uh, and we like to have that number or close to that number because there is some benefit for the students and for our, and for our Cape Elizabeth students to have sort of a critical mass of, of, of foreign exchange students. It is very dependent on families being willing to open their doors and making that commitment. So this year we were only able to have two foreign exchange students. Last, the last couple of years we've had four. My hope is we, we will get back to four again for next year because I think that's a, a nice number to have. Um, so how many students is another question are able to access classes online with our current subscription or what is our current capacity for allowing students to access online classes? And the real answer is that we don't have any um, capacity issue because really we don't have, a, we as a school don't have a subscription. Um, and right now, um, the cost for online, we, we are not a part of the virtual high school uh, consortium. We were for a couple of years and we found that it was a significantly underutilized resource. Perhaps that's something we would want to revisit in the future, but that proposal is not in the budget. Um, typically our families access one of, a, of several um, online programs that we have found are, are quality programs that are quite inexpensive. Um, and so the cost of participating in those online programs, at least at the present, is borne by, borne by families. Um, so there really isn't a limit. Um, then I received another set of questions today. Um, and I'll, I'll answer those that are sort of questions. So one of the questions was about the increase in cost of substitute teachers over the last year or two. Um, and really, my, I think that that really is simply to bring the, the, the budget line more in sync with what the actual expenses have been the last couple of years. That's accurate, as well as the discussion around increasing the base rate of pay for substitutes. Okay, yes, mm -hmm. yes, thank you. Um, so I think that's really what that is. It's not, it's not a, a expected increase in the number of subs we will get or the, or anything about our, the vacancy of the, the absences of our teachers. It's not driven by that in any way. Um, what is the appropriate teacher load for foreign language and other subjects, um, and are we exceeding it? Um, and I, and I, I know that's prompted by the, there's a, a, a table in my narrative that, sort of, that shows what the t average teacher load is in each of our, by department, in each one of our departments. And foreign language is definitely on the high side. My recollection is foreign language, I think, is 91.1, I believe. Um, that is slightly in excess of um, the guideline that the board set several years ago in policy IIB, which is uh, uh, there's a guideline of 75 to 90 students. Um, foreign language is the one area where we are, we are very slightly above that um, at 91.1. Um, and I know that's, that topic has been a general discussion at the board and past budget meetings and that sort of thing, so I'm not sure I need to go into more depth about that in this context, but that, that's, that's that area. Uh, da, 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 da. I will, oh, there's a question about, um, I, I wrote in the narrative about the possibility of an increase in our choral, lang choral music position by one semester section, which would translate into a 0.1 increase um, in, in terms of that position, that's dependent on signups. Um, and so, and it was, a, it was a good question, and it caused me to go back to the staffing page. And I just want to point one thing out if you, if you, want, uh, if you go back to staff salaries and benefits. That tab on the very first page, on that page, it's, there is a, it's called Teacher Drama. Are folks with me there? Mm -hmm. That amount there is actually enough to um, support the increase in the drama position by 0.1, which is an increase we experienced this year, and I expect will continue to, will persist again next year. Um, 
and also to increase the choral music position by that point one. Um, so that, that number really covers it. We'll have to clean up the way it, exactly the way it's delineated, but that, that number is enough to cover that should we get enough sign-ups to increase the choral music by, by one-tenth as well. Um, then let's see, the other questions are get to the text issues, and I will, I will get to those text issues. I will get that, get that to you within the next couple of days. The last question is about a, uh, a percentage increase that stands out in the high school budget, um, and that's, if I can, if you, back to the high school budget page, non-salaries, the second page. I think it's the second page. Yes, the second page, total high school administration, which is the first major division up at the top. The very last line under that, which is account 8920, 8100 dues and fees. There's an increase that's, that is very substantial. It's 98.29%. The total increase is $12,913. And that is because that's where those MEASC fees for the, for the visit are parked. Um, Actually, if you backed that amount out, the total for the NIASC expenses are actually anticipated to be 13400 So there have actually been a slight reduction in, in the rest of those dues. I guess fees. that's what it was, yep. Jeff, but I thought it's important for the public yep. to see a large increase in this because it, in that uh, an acronym that Jeff used is actually the accreditation for the, for the high school. Right. So, which is a fairly important thing to have. So, so that is a, a one-time expense. It will exist in the budget for this coming year if the board approves the budget, um, and then it will come out the following year because it's a once every ten year expenditure. So those that's my summary. Yeah, can I just point out because there was a question that came in earlier as well about charter school tuition. Oh yeah. Charter school tuition has been removed yep. from the high school budget, um, both the governor's proposed budget and the education committee's vote late last week or early this week um, have recommended mm -hmm. that the, those funds. Um, be derived from the state level so that they're not uh, put upon local districts to fund the cost of students from our district attending charter schools. So that 60000 reduction is reflected in the high school budget lines. It, and so I should probably clarify, thank you for saying that. I should clarify because if you look at the non-salaries budget, the actual change that's reflected on the second page is minus 5.52%. It's, it's in negative because of that $60,000 reduction. The balance of it is that $33,000 that I pointed out, which is, which is an increase. It's just that when that's, that that's balanced off against the charter school reduction, um, it looks like a negative number. But I can't claim any credit for that. So. <laughs> sure you can. <laughs> so, Jeff, I know... Uh, I'm not that desperate, Jeff. <laughs> I know when people, you know, it's, you will go, will go through and look at the big dollar changes. Um, but as assessment, 14527 that's an assessment. We have no... Whatever the increase is, we have to pay as part of... Has, so that's not a discretionary increase. Correct. There's a there's a formula, and I think Susanna is probably more familiar with it than I am. Um, there's a formula that all the sending schools have arrived at uh, based on the number of students um, who went to paths. I think a year or two years ago. It's always a right. year. It's formula, but it's 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 uh, non-discretionary. It's non-discretionary. In other words, that that's what we have to pay. Correct. And for NIAS, the other second largest increase is twelve thousand nine thirteen. That's accreditation fees that Correct. will have, that's in a way non-discretionary as well. If we want to be accredited. If we want to be accredited, which is probably a pretty good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, so those, the two largest items are non-discretionary. And then for equipment, decline of 10,000 for the achievement, uh, that's my southern accent, achievement center, um, the 10,471 decline is, that was related to the fact that we replaced computers in the Achievement Center last year. So, so it was large. It had a, there was a big bubble last year because of that replacement of computers. So that's not necessary, obviously, this year. Okay. And see, I will remind the board um, paid at the other half of that right. cost to replace the computers. In the and then there's a lot of focus on you know uh, workloads, teacher loads, class sizes. Um, you know, I know if you have children in Pond Cove or the middle school, it's, you know, class size, 
and you know, it's been a lot of time on it, but uh, you know, teacher load, um, the guidelines 75 to 90. I get asked every year, why is instructional instrumental music? That's double the guideline. Maybe just share what, what the. Yeah, and that, and that would be true in virtually every school because, um, because bands are large. Um, right. But, but band teachers are used to dealing with, they want large bands. Um, it's a good thing to have, so it's, 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 I don't think the 75 to 90 guideline was in any way anticipated that it was, was going to apply to a provision like that. It's only a good thing that our sign-ups are that healthy. I just want to make a, uh, a clarification. We've got some questions that noted various savings, like the savings of the $60,000, if, by the way, it ultimately gets passed. Um, why isn't that passed on to taxpayers? And, well, the, the reality is, if I pass it on to taxpayers, I'd have to raise um, the increase in taxes. You can't just pass on a savings. It's, that savings is netted into what we already, as, as an increase. So I can't simply take that out and pass it on any more than I could some little savings in um, Purchase the books from one year to the next. It, 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 it's, it takes up for an increase in another item. Okay. Anybody have any other questions on the Jeff's uh, narrative or the non salaries and benefits high school budget? Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. I guess in reverse order, we'll go uh, to the middle school. All right, thank you. Uh, start with the, the middle school, the non-salary and benefits side. Um, the overall budget proposal for the middle school um, includes um, modest increases in individual line items, and I broke those out. So across our supply line, books and periodicals, books and periodicals for the library learning commons, equipment for the library learning commons and instructional technology software overall were total increases of just over $24,000 um, against um, some small reductions across other lines with just minor variations in, in costs came out to just about an overall net increase of just under $20,000. Um, so within each of those lines, our biggest increase line is in our supply line uh, of just over $16,000. And the, some of that increase is accounted for in that um, teachers are requesting some uh, additional math and science supplies. We increase over past years um, with the science supplies, we're finding we have aging uh, science kits um, marked a lot by consumable items and teachers are seeking to really be able to replenish those and update those those kits to have um, re not only the replenishment of the consumables but some of those materials and supplies um, have not been updated or upgraded in, in quite a bit of time so through science kits for that um, and some additional math supplies and resources um, with our alignment to the Common Core and with our assessment of our, our current math program and the amount of supplementing that happens and teachers um, being more, uh, you know, innovative and, and thinking outside the box and looking to, to meet the needs of all students, you know, seeking uh, variety of in instructional strategies and techniques to bring the, the content to the students. So there, we're seeing increase in, in requests for different kinds of materials. And um, I put text, uh, math and science text resources, and that was probably a little bit confusing. And what I meant by that was there has been a, a math magazine and science magazine requests, which I, I think technically are periodicals. So. The question of whether they should have gone under supplies or, or books and periodicals is, is probably uh, a good question to pose it. It may just, I don't, I'm not sure if those are in the, in the correct areas or not because the, it looks like the two resources requested for across 7th and 8th for math and for science, um, short text resources, I guess I'll call them, um, are, are probably technically periodicals. Um, but that, those were new, new requests uh, that we hadn't seen before. Um, we have two instructional uh, strategists um, who have 
um, submitted supply requests, which was new new this year. Um, we're seeing general overall increase in, in supply requests and the cost, shipping and handling, costs of materials have gone up slightly uh, overall. So kind of all of those little bits and pieces in total amounted to the to the sixteen thousand dollar increase and there, you know there are other uh, other pieces to that that I could explain. But overall those are some of the key the key highlights of that line item. Um, under books and periodicals, the fifth grade um, has added the, the everyday math second journal to the curriculum. Um, it was added this year. It was not budgeted for, so we budgeted the amount of, of adding that cost in, in addition to novels for literature circles, professional writing resources for teachers with some of the writing workshop uh, work that's happening across five through eight uh, account for some of the, the items in that um, in that line. Should I pause for a second? Yeah. I think so. The iPad went dark. This is kind of like when we used to have eight tracks. There's still some songs and poems. No problem. All right. So is the iPad important? It said flip tape. So we had to flip the tape, so that's why I paused <laughs> and spaced out. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, I, I was mentioning the professional writing research for teachers across five through eight. Um, our library learning commons with our um, repurposing and our renovation through the kindness of of CEF grant and uh, also support from our MSBA. We did a huge weeding out of our collection of outdated materials and um, Jonathan and Amanda are looking to build our collection back up and to replace some of those outdated materials which were um, um, taken off the shelves. Um, they're also adding some additional equipment following that remodel and repurpose of uh, examples would be things like iPods, iPad stands, and they're doing a lot with media and filming and other technologies. So there's lots of little gizmos and gadgets that come along with that that are part of part of that. Um, that's not a technical term. Uh, those aren't technical <laughs> terms. Instructional technology software overall um, guidance is kind of looking to build there. Um, the, the school counselors are building up some materials that they have. On, on bullying, on harassment, on some other uh, health-related uh, topics, some school counseling apps, and we've also um, adding some additional music subscriptions and apps added. Um, those are kind of the key elements taken all in total really represent the, the line item increases for, for the middle school, middle school budget. To go to the, the salaries and benefits side, um, overall we're um, seeing that our outgoing eighth grade class of um, 151 students is being replaced by an incoming fifth grade class of a ha uh, 112 students, so it's a, a difference of 39 students. Um, to, to account for that shift and, and looking across teachers, classrooms, and class sizes, the middle school is proposing to take the current six teachers that are in fifth grade and reduce that to six, six um, sorry, re take the current six teachers in fifth grade and reduce that to five teachers um, as the current seventh grade of, of 130 students moves forward into eighth grade, we'd be reducing that from seven classes equivalent to, to six classes. Um, and using one of those positions, either call it the fifth grade or the eighth grade position, and spreading that across sixth, seventh grade to help cover uh, teaching of classes and also to, um, to work with class sizes. And that second position would be accounted for by a retirement that, that we have. So it would be a loss of one position and a reassignment of the second position across sixth and seventh grade um, to keep our class sizes at uh, around 21 with fifth grade at uh, about 22.4. For overall 24 teachers with an overall average class size of 21.6. One of the, in looking forward at projections and, and enrollments, we see that the current 
third grade coming up to us in two years will return, uh, I believe it was to 137 students. So we want to be well positioned to absorb absorb that class as they as they come in and have um, teaching staff and current teachers familiar with content with our teams to be able to to be ready so to keep keep our position use it well in the interim year and then also be able to reassign that to the to the fifth grade team for that class coming up I did have some uh, some questions that came in I believe Jeff has uh, kind of addressed the sub uh, substitute um, question about why there is an increase so I'll, I'll leave that be assuming that that's been answered um, the, the increase in supplies over not only from last year but over over two years why is that happening and um, it's 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 really kind of increase in costs and I think the requests that teachers make on a year year basis vary a little bit within grade level and with within teams so what what they're saying they need um, what we're saying we can provide we go through a, a process and, and we, we go through and add up what, what they need and um, I think the biggest shifts in that have really been you know like I said, what I outlined before is the, the, the specific science and, and math uh, content materials that we're seeing um, we are we have added you know more more chorus with the fifth and sixth course happening during the day so the materials have been requested for that um, we're seeing more requests for building up classroom libraries and, and materials for literature circles and writing resources and things like that um, we've, um, you know our world language program our students take uh, um, several of the you know reputable exams and th those costs get do increase and go up and, and are added so um, so, so overall I, I, they're not huge shifts but I think we see you know from from year to year that th those have an impact on, on those particular lines uh, that go up um, overall I, the the you know, with the strategic plan obviously being in mind and our I indicators of success, the, the question and kind of looking at the staff development line has been noted as how come that's not going up with, with um, some of the changes we're looking at and making in terms of math and aligning to the Common Core and, and um, preparing students for uh, algebra and, and, and availability of geometry and whatnot. How is it happening? And I think we're really doing a lot of that work within uh, the time and resources that we already have. Um, we have common planning time that happens, um, you know, every day, uh, every five days. Um, one of those meetings is dedicated to math, another to science, one to social studies, one to two language arts. So a lot of that curriculum alignment, curriculum planning, development of common assessments, uh, support of teacher work happens during during that time. So there's really no no additional costs to that. It's just it's about how that work is happening within what we already have. And we have brought in two math consultants coaches this year, which I think came more from Ruth Ellen's uh, area grant, of the grant budget monies. Um, grant monies. Uh, which have helped, which wouldn't have an increase for the for the middle school budget, um, and um, a lot of that kind of ongoing organic in-house professional development that can happen within our school day without sending people out, I think, is a is a large part of of how that's happening, um, and using the professional development staff development money that we already um, have. Um, use I think teachers use judiciously and they, they use well and the things we are sending people out for are largely prioritized around um, around <laughs> mathematics around common core work around differentiated instruction um, around uh, we have some people going out uh, for some executive function work we have people doing a lot of work around the Steve Wessler and train the trainer and all of that wrapped up into staff development PD but we're doing that within the existing mounts that we've had it's just a matter of prioritizing around that so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there um, and see if there are questions and see if I've adequately answered questions that have been posed David um, I, I, you, I think you have mostly answered my question about I was surprised that there isn't more staff development to 
handle a fairly significant increase in the level of math being taught in middle school. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't aware that we had grants, but are you both, um, you and Ruth Allen, comfortable that our teachers in middle school are getting enough support to be able to teach algebra, algebra and geometry essentially to more students? <laughs> I, I would say I am. Uh, they're working very hard, <laughs> and they're spending a lot of time doing that. But I feel with with our um, master schedule template that we've implemented this year, that we're um, sort of looking at and assessing, and as we're designing for for next year, um, the amount the amount of time that they have to work together as a team has been critical. I'm hearing from math teachers that they they feel the support has been really excellent um, that they've had through the two coaches that we've had. They, the teachers have really responded well with them. Whenever um, we've learned of workshops that have come up, um, you, um, Sharma is the name of another uh, resident kind of uh, uh, expert in math. Whenever he comes around, we send people out to those kinds of workshops and other opportunities. So I, I think I, I feel confident and agree with the time we have in-house and through grant money and things we've been able to capitalize on. And I'm hearing from the teachers that they, they feel very well supported in that. Okay. That, that, lot, thank a, you. A lot of the work is supported through Title IIA funding as well. So that's that's done a lot of the, the coaching that we've had come in. Um, it will be sending a number of teachers to the National Council of Teachers of Math conference that's coming up in April. Um, so that's an additional source that we've had to be able to kind of rally around this. I just wanted to make sure that if we're gonna, unlike some people think we all, all we do is cut. I, I want to make it clear that if we're imposing a significant new challenge that we, I'm personally willing to fight for whatever funds we need to do it. If you're comfortable, fine. If not, that's what I want to know. Yeah, I appreciate the question. We're hearing we're okay, and if, if, if I'm hearing we're not, I'll certainly keep that in mind and, and let everyone know. Um, but I think for now, Thank you. we're okay. Thank you. John. Um, Mike, I wanted to ask about class sizes. We, we discussed it uh, at some length last year right. in this process. Um, it looks like, I think this year we have a couple of sixth grade classrooms that are uh, one student above the four guideline of 22. It looks like you've got two fifth grade classrooms next year. On the basis of, of this year's experience, can you um, characterize your confidence that um, those classrooms will um, will be effective uh, next year. So I want to make sure I understand the question. Well, is it looks like we've got two fifth grade classrooms, if I'm understanding this correctly, that are out of five next year that are projected to have 23 students in them, which is one more than the board guideline of 22. We talked, to, you know about the fact that that's a guideline um, but you know we do want, when we go over it we want to make sure we're, we're doing so thoughtfully right uh, you have some sixth grade classrooms that are over that guideline this year has has that been a problem um, in those classrooms or are you comfortable that next year in fifth grade that there won't right. be a problem in those I mean I think the, the context of, of middle schools is a is certainly a little bit different than different grade levels that elementary and, and the, the, the kinds of supports and things that that are being you know provided and students learning to read and write and, and all the additional things that they need I, you know I think I would say make clear that what may work well at the middle school may not be what's what's ideal because of the the differences that exist between students at different developmental stages and well that's why we have three mm -hmm. different class size guidelines at the elementary school for one for K, one for one and two, one right. for three and four. So we, we, I hope we address that within our guidelines. Yeah, I, and I would say I would say it does, and, and so um, I, I definitely agree with that approach. And I think um, to to speak to that, um, with the with the fifth grade, um, the idea of you know six versus five, um, you know eighteen plus students per class versus you know around twenty two, it, it's a tough. 
uh, consideration and certainly conversations that we're having at at the middle school is, is what's best can we meet the needs of, of students at at 22-3 um, they're doing it now they're doing it well um, you know it doesn't mean we don't have conversations and, and raise questions about you know I what what is the ideal and, and obviously um, teachers feel strongly the, the, the fewer students I have the 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 better they feel that they're able to do, but what's the tipping point? We talked a lot about that last year of when it makes a difference. I feel confident with the class sizes we've proposed for middle school age students. Um, we are still in that sweet spot that I think we, we can meet their needs. We do see a little bit of, of variations here. They're average class sizes because we do do a little bit of um, grouping when it comes to the different math courses that students take. But on the whole, I think these are very reasonable class sizes where teachers uh, can be responsive to the needs of students. Okay, thank you. Okay. Barbara. Just a <coughs> quick question. I'm sorry to get this too soon. That's okay. Um, in looking at this strategic plan, and, and the question comes around the 16,000 increase in instructional supplies, which I'm sure is likely fine. This this current year is when, in the plan, you were really going to be working on the crosswalk of next generation science standards. And next year is when you were going to really review and assess the alignment and student performance in science and really make some curriculum decisions. So I just wondered if your mostly just patching up science kits to get through till some decisions make next year or if you're wholesale replacing some and I just wondered where you were on that time time frame I think it's the first okay. it's more of a kind of patchwork replacement while that more thorough comprehensive okay. analysis will happen next year like next you year. said so you may be changing out some kits at that point or yeah, absolutely I yeah. think all that will be under review some of those may be shifting between grade levels mm -hmm. as we look to see where the alignments fit and so it's really more the interim step hold in place yes. till you can get to those thank you and just to follow up on john's question i know uh parents uh you know if it's fran you know there's a decline in uh, teachers from 25 to 24 um so uh you know that obviously people are focusing on that but at the same time um, it looks like the average class size is actually declining or, or comparable. Um, so maybe for on the school board, when you're doing this every year, you, you know, we tend to focus more on class size where if I was reading a narrative and said, oh my gosh, there's going to be one less teacher, um, you know, maybe just on, on the average class sizes, it looks like fifth grade is going to go from 23.1 to 22.4. Sixth grade will go from 22.8 to 21.4, seventh grade 21.7 to 21.1, and eighth grade would be 21.6 to 21.7. So it looks like even though there's one less teacher, at least in three of the four grades, the class sizes will be smaller than this year. Is, is that That's fair? correct. Thank you. Um, and I had another question, but it, it oh. Um, a team teaching model someone will say uh, we got a question uh, and how do you you know if team teaching you think of it's two people um, if you have five teachers or seven teachers how, how does that work in other words how do you um, when you need an even number of teachers um, we just got one of the questions through email you know so if I have a you know eighth grader this year there's seven teachers if it's team teaching, you know, how do you do it with the odd number of teachers? Okay, so if, the, if there are a team of seven right. or a team of five, how, how are those classes allocated? So um, basically, I mean, seventh grades and eighth grade are scheduled a little bit differently because they, they have slightly more, more different, there are different sections that they're offered. But, um, whether what if they're co co teaching the idea of truly co teaching it's two two teachers in the in the same classroom right. you know working together at the same time but if they're we're talking about teaching an odd number like we have seven classes like we currently do in the eighth grade or or five 
how, how is that going to impact teaming? And so we've got to look at certification, highly qualified status, the number of teachers that we need we need covered, and what is the best way to try to, to try to align teachers together. Uh, ideally, working in teams we know is is, is best practice. So, um, I, and I, I'm not sure if I'm. I'm getting a little confused with the co-teaching part of your question, so maybe can you ask me one more time? And I'll yeah. Uh, you're intending, I think, to ask about teams. If you're, yeah, if a team has two teams. teachers, <laughs> and you have, and you have five okay. people, you'd say, well, here's two, here's two, and then there's one. So, oh, I'm overcomplicating things. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You know, you're in the weeds, too, but it's like, all right, if there's team teaching and you have an odd number. Okay. How does that work? So at fifth grade, if we have the five classes, right. the question would be, you know, do you have a three person and a two person, or are there other models? And, and you know, so, so I'll be working you know, with the fifth grade team if this proposal is the way we, in fact, end up going and need to go. You know, what works? What have you done in the past? Have, you know, they have done a three and two in the past and made that work. Um, obviously, two, two, and one comes out <coughs> mathematically even, but it raises questions about if you have one self-contained class and other that are two-person teams, what's right for, for which kids? And you're, you're offering something that looks v very different, and can you do that equitably? So I'd say probably a three and a two is more more viable possibility. Um, the way we did eighth grade this year was a four and a three. Um, and then it's just a matter of, of their scheduling their time around what right, but, but the parent uh, support in the history of the schools, uh, but this, this I assume wouldn't be the first year we had an odd number of teachers. In fact, in eighth grade last year we had seven teachers. That's, by my calculation, an odd number. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but I, you know, there's just something we'll get a question. It just, um, it, when you're in the, Profession, it, you know, here's how it works, but it can sometimes be simple. Well, how do you get? Um, so, thank you, but you probably get some questions on that. I, I um, think the true follow-up question is going to be, how are you going to divide the team with six and a half teachers? Well, I. So, does Sorry, anyone have any? That's right. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Um, so, does anyone have any more questions for the middle school at, at this time? I, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Um, in presenting your overall budget and pulling out the line items that are significant changes with a rationale column, I, I found that incredibly easy to understand, follow, and um, and just see as I was observing the, the budget. And I would love to see budgets presented with more of these types of um, the line item budget, the increase or the decrease amount in the rationale behind it. I just think it's easy for us, and I also feel that it's probably easier for our constituents to see. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have another question? We're heading. Go ahead. Um, I love that I have all four of you in a row, and I'm, I'm going to ask you, Mike, because um, you're the the middle. Uh, you're the middle school. The middle child. The middle child. <laughs> um, I'm as we talk about professional development and the uh, math programs. You, you can all answer, but language art programs, um, uh, Common Core that came six years ago, mm -hmm. Common Core, four uh, year, four and a half. With, uh, when Alan Hawkins, Hawkins was here, the Common Core mm -hmm. came in. Um, RTI came in nine years ago um, by law, uh, a long time ago. So as these I'm going to call them movements, um, educational decisions by the state, federal and state are made. And then it comes down to districts. We want, of course, them to change in Pond Cove Middle School and then up to high school so our kids get the, um, so they're, they're, they're in, you know, by high school, each full grade, benefit they get the, the thank you a full benefit of the program, and now we have Ruth Ellen. So I guess I want some insurance that what's happening in Pond Cove, um, as I went through the list, um, teacher down the hall. Um, I'm not gonna be able to name all the the new projects that are happening. Are the the writing program, the reading program, the math program, and there's two questions about the math. Um, 
um, buying books for the math. Is what's happening in Pond Cove directly going to move to benefit the kids in middle school, move to high school? And you don't have to answer every subject, of course, but I guess I want, is there a plan and a protocol for how you do professional development to meet the needs of the state and federal guidelines so that we're saving, we're helping the kids out, and we're helping teachers out so there's a common language between teachers to keep the schools aligned? You can just say yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, really what I want to hear. Yeah. Really, a, a lot of it is aligning to those standards, and that those standards are the first vertical link that helps to hold all of those pieces together across schools, across programs. Because if we're aligned vertically to what those standards say kids need to know, understand, and be able to do, then it's going to systematically flow one into the other. Now, to say that professional development is done at the high school the same way it's done at the middle school, it's done at the Conco, it's not because the needs are different, the programs are different, and access to teachers and how we, we get at the work tends to be different. Is there somebody who kind of sees where they all are headed in one direction? I guess that would be me. Yes. Yeah. I, it is. Thank you. Yes. So, and I do speak with these people on a regular basis. So, great. Thank you. Can I ask a quick follow-up to that? And, and is it also you then who looks at RTI compliance in the three schools? Uh, is that yes, under you? Yes. And each each one of the central office staff works with the RTI group for mm -hmm. each one of the buildings. So, um, we divvy that part up as well. As a yes. quick editorial comment, I would appreciate learning more about, not now, Okay. learning Thank more you. about that okay. um, as, we, as we go forward. Okay. Thanks. So, Katie, uh, maybe later on, on uh, when we get to that topic, we can follow up on more on professional development and any follow-up questions you have. Thanks. Um, Kelly, I guess you're, you're up to bat. That. Um, so I, like my two comrades here, um, I will not I'll spare you going through the entire narrative, but I'll focus on um, the summary of the proposed budget um, for 15-16. Um, the staffing side of it, as you know in the narrative, um, we're proposing a reduction um, potentially of one teacher in, at the kindergarten level. Um, based on the projected enrollment that we have from planning decisions from um, the report that we have that is projecting approximately 88 students, but we just never know. So we are, um, as um, Superintendent said, Meredith has said that there's contingency funds available should we need a sixth class. So if we, if we need to, we, we won't make um, decisions on placement until um, August, if we're even kind of on the fence of that, so to save from having to dismantle any um, or anyone get attached to who they think they may be having for their first public school experience. Um, so, and I, uh, like um, like Mike and Jeff, I got some um, late afternoon questions that, that were emailed to me, and so I will try to answer some of those as I go along. But at the end, I can I can address those um, where it makes sense. Um, Throughout my um, presentation here, I can I can do that for part of that. Within the regular, uh, the non-staffing side of the budget um, proposal for next year, probably one of the, the biggest pieces is going to be um, the implementation of um, the new Everyday Math Edition, the fourth edition that aligns specifically with the Common Core State Standards. Currently, our kindergarten is our new full-day kindergarten. It's going spectacularly. Um, is implementing that right now, and so grades one through four will be implementing it next year. Um, we um, had that, the teacher resource, I know there were two questions around books regarding math. The teacher resource packages um, that come with manuals, that come with basically everything a teacher needs um, to roll out a program, 
that comes under books and we got we have a wonderful deal from McGraw Hill a buy one get one free because I think we are the first consumer of everyday math in the state they tell us so um, we were the pioneers of everyday math who knew and so each of those um, packages teacher resource packages is 300 approximately 320 dollars so we for every one we buy we get one free so all of those that we're um, purchasing for next year come in just under $5,000. So really that could be potentially I mean, a savings of close to $5,000. So we're pretty pleased with that. The consumable, the, the, the workbooks, um, which are the student journal packages, those, uh, there's a question about that. Why, why, um, why aren't those under books? Because those are consumables, workbooks we have to purchase every year, those come under supplies. So that's what that that's what that is, and sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes they get inverted. So, um, and uh, another big piece for the coming year is um, it's already been referenced is ongoing professional development for um, getting for getting us on board and aligned with Common Core state standards, um, particularly in English language arts math and science. In fact, Rathel and Julie and I had a meeting this morning about um, what that's going to look like literally within weeks um, as we get started really in preparation for summer work that we're going to be doing and getting our um, report card aligned with that for the coming year. We, it's actually in my narrative um, to have that by um, summer 2016, but we're seeing it. We want it really for next year, so we want it even sooner. So that would be a change in, um, uh, in the narrative. Um, another uh, another big piece in our proposed budget is in the equipment line, and I know there were some questions around chairs. We are in pretty dire need of chairs, particularly for grades one, two, and three. Kindergarten and fourth grade are set. Kindergarten has all the chairs and fourth grade is um, the chairs. But um, a question was asked about how old are the chairs and how what's their age usage. The current chairs we have, and any of you are invited to go over and sit in them for um, any length of time, and I think you would happily Implying go out. We're small enough to Happily go out, and you'd be surprised. You'd just sit down. But um, they are, uh, we were trying to um, estimate how old they are. Most of them were purchased right around the time that the Pond Cove Middle School Complex was renovated. So that's how long we've had most of those chairs in those grade levels. Yep. So you know how long ago that was? Yeah, uh, 1996. So 95, 96 is when it was when it was renovated. So what we've been doing, and um, Meredith and I have talked about getting a furniture uh, cycle replacement going, um, but then when we implemented um, full day kindergarten, obviously the equipment went into that, th those lines for a, a couple of years. So we're, but our biggest need is chairs. So rather than do full replacement of desks, tables, we really don't, it's really the chairs that we need. So really targeting what we need. And one of the reasons is, um, they are not, most of them are not adjustable. So we have ch children, obviously, not just of different ages, but different sizes within grades. Um, they break pretty easily. They're extraordinarily uncomfortable. Um, there is, um, the children are always bringing us screws. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how many, um, and many of probably parents sitting here and staff will know, you know, when you sit down, you're kind of going this sometimes. So. Um, in looking at the budget, they're, they're expensive, but we want to get high quality ones. We want them to be adjustable. Um, so our plan is to purchase enough for two first grades and one second grade. We've already started with second grade last year as we could, um, but that's, that's one of the big, big items that we need. Um, with professional development, um, there, was a, there was a question about how are we, I think similar to yours, like, you know, are, are we allocating enough money for staff development? And um, we think so, but we can always shift out of our improvement within our improvement of instruction lines um, for some of our summer work in between work workshops and professional um, conferences are coming up. It's a, it's a little tricky sometimes to um, project how much we're going to need based on what's going to be offered and what's going to be appropriate. and. We, one thing that was added um, this year is for the next year is a requirement that we're going to be asking all staff um, 
when they want to attend a conference, when they want to attend a, a workshop, um, to really show us where is that uh, in alignment to the strategic plan and how are you going to be sharing it out. We do that already with the sharing out part, but we really haven't been really tight with where is it in the strategic plan, how does this align with what this mm -hmm. work is that will continue up. So that um, is a piece um, for next year. Um, we ha and there's a lot of offerings, um, but we, we're really trying to um, target, build on the work that we've been already been doing. Um, there's a question about um, some of our work and some of our listings in the strategic plans is continue this. Because we teach everything um, at the elementary level, I mean, as I said, next year we're implementing um, a new addition for everyday math. Um, two years ago, we started implementing units of teachers' college units of study writing. This is our second year. So we're, we're always um, evaluating and refining and improving on that. Two years, bef uh, three years before that, we, we started implementing Foundation's new phonics program. So we're, we don't want to, it's, it's a continual cycle of now, is this working, going back, and how can we make it better? And, um, not putting too much on our place while at the same time moving forward. So, um, and then um, there were um, some questions about um, for in the text libraries, where what's the cost for each grade level for um, in the book line? Um, the book line has a, just under five thousand dollars of that is the um, everyday math um, resource packages for teachers. And then um, for grade levels, it's approximately, it's, it's between four, $4,000, $4,800 per grade level approximately. And it really varies, and I can get more specific information for the board if, if you'd like. But it really varies on, um, teachers are taking really careful inventory about what their needs are, particularly <coughs> on how we're going to do um, close reading for um, to meet the standards for the Common Core, both in narrative and in informational text. Like, for example, first grade was noticing informational text that seems to be just loaded with mammals and sea life, and we want more topic, <coughs> informational topics, and doing that finite inventorying, th that, kind of in that kind of work. Um, I think um, Mike and uh, I think Jeff had answered about the, the substitute line. Um, is for, that question came my way as well, and I know there was a, there was a question about um, class size, um, and I actually have an update on. We've actually had new students enroll since this. Um, if you look on page eight, the projected enrollment. Um, there was a question about um, for next year for grade two, and grade two. Um, Currently, we have um, 106 students, and we have two more registered for next year for 108. So that will bring six classrooms to 18 students. Um, and so, and we have um, for next, we have actually six students already registered for next year, bringing even like grade grade three will be going down the grade. Current grade two has five teachers, and current grade three has six teachers. And so that teacher that's in grade three is going back to grade two next year, and grade three is going down to five classes. Um, it's um, going up to 102 students, what we know so far. Actually, it is 102 students right now. Next year's fourth grade, we already have two new students registered, so next year's fourth grade, as of right now, we'll have 136 students. And as I said, kindergarten is kind of a wild card, so we're just keeping an eye on that, as is first grade. And we, um, we tend to have um, more first graders coming in. I've been giving a lot of tours lately to families. A lot of twins out there. I, I don't know, a lot of tours for twins, so. Um, and uh, some, some families definitely moving to Cape, and others that are just kind of looking around, seeing if this, is a, this community is a good fit for them. Um, and other, any other, maybe, other questions? I'm looking at my other. Maybe Kelly, just on the class size, mm -hmm. uh, there's one under, uh, maybe it's easier to see under the selling benefits line, but uh, you'd mentioned kindergarten. 
last year was 16.7, you know, 17.6. You've already addressed that that's probably the hardest uh, enrollment to, to, um, to project. And you mentioned there's the contingency funds of higher than projected. First grade would go from 17.3 to 18.7. That's below the 20 guideline. Second grade, 20.2 to 17.3. That would be actually one of the smaller class sizes in schools, but that would be well below the the, sev the 20, you know, so guideline. Great. And then third grade, 22.3 would go down to 20.2. That would be below the guideline. So the only class that might be at the higher end of the guideline of 18 to 22 is, is, is fourth grade, which you had mentioned. Right. But all the other ones are well below um. um the i'm looking at the first grade um would be if with a projected um enrollment of 112 i had um would be at 18.6 is that correct right. you can come. oh okay. right. thank you my colleagues that gave me here. um 19.7 um, and then the second grade for next year we know is going to be at 108. Um, we know that definitely, so that um, would be, 18. be at 18. Um, and then th third grade um, we know is going to be at 102, and that would be at, um, with five classes, 20.4. And it would be the in the fourth grade with six classes um, at 136 would be 22.6. So, does that make sense? Yes, thank you, okay. John. So, are, are you comfortable with? So that sounds like four uh, fourth grade classrooms that have um, an addition, a, a 23 kids in the classroom as opposed to 22. Are you comfortable? With, uh, that those classrooms will be effective learning environments for those children and will you be able to explain to parents that... Since we had this question last year, didn't we? <laughs> I think we've had this conversation before. Yes, we have before, had this yeah. conversation in the same class, I think. Um, you know, that's obviously a number we'll watch closely. Um, it is right at that cusp. Um, we have six fabulous fourth grade teachers, but, you know, we will see. I mean, right now we know there's two that are definitely registered, you know, that for, for next year. Right. No, I'm, I'm not asking, though, you know, what happens if, if we have additional registrations right. that we're not projecting now. Right. But for You're right now, going in. You're saying there's 136 that we know about now. So we know there's four. Mm -hmm. Right now we're projecting four classrooms that are 23 kids. So right. what I'm trying to understand is your level of comfort with those classrooms at 23 I mean, it's not ideal, but I mean, I'm I'm comfortable with it. I mean, I just as I said, I want to keep a close eye. You know, I, I mean, I know you're always comfortable. careful in terms of how. You know, we talked about this at length right. last year. How right. the classrooms are constructed and so forth, right. so that they can be uh, a, that it has a lot to do with the mix of the right. kids and all that. And I know you work very hard to make sure you have got the the best balance. Each teacher, but I just want to understand your level of comfort with the with the, with the budget proposal as it stands. Um, I think if we you don't have anyone, you know, it it does. We don't get a big bubble, you know. I'd be comfortable with it, and I think you know, obviously, would be really working hard to make sure those classrooms are balanced as we always do. But um, it's a you know, microfer, you know, projecting of. Potentially even adding one more by the time it gets to you. We just we just watch it closely and make sure the balance and the support that those classrooms need are in place. Right, and we often mm -hmm. meet in August, usually around instructional support, to right. discuss you know changes in anticipated student need and how, how we would respond and addressing that. So we know they have good chairs. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Can right, thank you, Kelly. Sure. Just uh, um, and then I'll get to David. Um, just so uh, there's a line item in there for supplies uh, that are, it's increasing 15,000. Oh, yes. And, and just so, um, you know, that, you know, whoa, that's a yes. big increase, but I believe it's uh, uh, 
placeholder allocation for a different. And Meredith and I talked about that earlier right. today. She was going to talk about that. That's for the preschool. Exactly. So I just want everyone to know is. if the way it's constructed now, uh, you know, of the twelve thousand five hundred sixty-seven dollar change, fifteen more. You know, uh, fifteen thousand dollars of the increase is actually in a line item that may be re allocated to a different budget right. just so everyone um, understands that 15,000 is uh, is preschool that as of now well we'll discuss this after instructional support but uh, so in your budget books under and next year we're going to number these pages um, um, you know, the 15000 for the board's benefit, 8720 under Ponco. Mm -hmm. right. Under Ponco. Oh, yeah. Okay. The $15,000 is for the supplies for the preschool proposal, which is not technically part of the Ponco budget, um, just so you know. And we'll update these at some point. So. So, so along that line, Michael, if that was subtracted from the overall change, he's actually below last year's request. Yeah, exactly. you have right. to sort of net out the one-time expenses for kindergarten and right. right. last right. year's budget. Right. Similar to the charter school, we saw those right. you know, reductions, but yeah, it's down. And where are those? Up in the, under um, regular instruction, um, we're down in supplies and books and periodicals because we had that increase last year to add to full day kindergarten right. classrooms. Yeah, and, and I have $100,000 in my mind for that one time figure. Is it, was the rest of that in facility? So 50 was the renovation cost right. and 50 was supplies and materials. So this would add up to 50 then? Am I, am I missing nope, uh, we had equipment yeah. in there too. We had. And the point is the yeah. 8720 supplies, the $15,000 increase is part of the uh, yeah, I know yeah, oh, yeah. That, but the last year for the kindergarten. So if we mm -hmm. had a one-time expense of fifty thousand last year, should the red lines equal equal? It, it was yeah. in more than one line. So we're not it was going to find one line. Size, materials, and equipment. Okay. One time means you're not, you know. Yes. Seven, twelve. I think what Kate's pointing out is that even the deductions. Even with the even with the <coughs> distributing the, all that out, it's not right, equal to fifty thousand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. While there were while there was a one time cost, clearly there are equipment or supplies needs that go beyond the the, the level of spending of the <coughs> budget the year before that. Because we held off on like the chairs, we we, we right. held we held off on that. Um, I can't wait to sit in those chairs. So that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so for Ponco. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, David. Um, I had asked a question which you addressed by, um, I think you've addressed. Um, I, I was noticing in, because this chart is in the public record this way, that for grade two in 1415 we had 101 kids and it was only going to one, 104 in 1516. So an increase of three students, we're going to get one more teacher. It seemed odd to me. Um, but we now have, it's really going to be 108 kids right, rather than 104. What's the guideline for second grade? Because it just seemed to me bizarre, uh, strange that you'd have an increase of a teacher for an, uh, a difference of three kids. It's we have just, the guideline is for, for grade And so with 108, if we only had five, it would be about 21. Um, um, it would be actually three classes of 22 and two classes of 21. So, it's, so we can more easily justify the increase in the teacher there because now we have four more kids. Yes, right. It's all these are projected. And you know, we know we have people signed up. We know we sometimes have people leave over the summer. We sometimes have more kids come. So I would be cautious about saying any of these are definite numbers, these right. are all projected numbers. I, I'm just saying that if somebody looks at this budget carefully, which a lot of people do, I, I would question why we're adding a teacher for an increase of three kids. But it's now seven, um, seven more kids. Well, David, the way I would answer it is, you're, you know, the, the total number of students is, is um, 
the total number of teachers is declining by one teacher and across the entire Hong Kong school. The total number of students is declining by, by nine. And there's a reduction of one teacher. So you can, if you, as we found out last year, if you look at an individual grade only, you know, you can, you could talk all night about, you know, what's the right mix, but basically the, the student-teacher ratio in Pankov isn't proposed to change very much. It's changing from 19.3 students per teacher to 9, no, I'm sorry, 19.13 last year to 19.5. Spread out, and um, it's currently in that grade. We have 106 students, and we have two that have definitely registered to make it 108 for next year. <coughs> Susanna, um, I just wanted to ask since it was brought up tonight um, about the the decision to not increase world language um, staffing um, since it is spread so thin in the limited. Um, offerings in the, I think she said five, mm -hmm. five or six we course. We had discussed it, actually, we, we had discussed it um, as a leadership team, and it didn't make it through the round, main meals, but just being respectful of, you know, how far it got, we did have some discussions about it. Um, and part, a lot of it has to do, with, I mean, a lot of, not, the, not whether to add, um, you know, how, whether it got added or not um, at that level, but um, scheduling is, is pretty tricky, and so, and, um, um, senior, uh, senior Chase and my dog Chase, um, said, um, uh, two 15-minute periods is actually supposed to be longer, but it's just the transition time is, is really challenging. Um, uh -huh. so, you know, we're, we're considering, you know, with space, keeping her in one location for next year, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're been meeting, going round and around on scheduling. It changed a couple of times this year um, to see how we can improve upon it. And we, we definitely want, you know, here, like we say, some you know, we can just it enough, but really. I mean, we definitely want to improve on that. Um, it's just, but we did, we did have that discussion about it, it just it just reminds me as you were talking um, you know to explain to um, the audience or anybody watching um, to who may not realize that when we refer to the district leadership you know it's it's all the administration and um, principals and obviously superintendent and and they are there everybody's the spokesperson for their school so it's not like it's a, um, a one voice decision um, so just just since that was mentioned tonight, I thought it'd be important to ask and that's a good question. and remind people that that's how these decisions are made. You know, it's, it's a group. But thank you, Could John, I, John. I'd like to follow up on that, Susanna. Thank you, because um, what Marsha Chase said was, um, we the world language teachers don't have enough time with students in the classroom. And, Propose the solution being being more staffing, but there's another constraint on time beyond staffing, which is time itself. Do we have time? If we had the staffing, do we have time? I mean, you only have time in the day if you take that away from something else, right? But if we increase world language staffing, we would that would be only one part of our decision. We would also have to decide what part of the day of, for pond covers would we be eliminating that they're currently doing? Would it be less recess or would it be less? It would never be less recess. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it shouldn't um, ever be less recess. Yeah. Um, well, it, and that's where we have to get really creative. So if you think ideally three times, if we offered Spanish and French three times a week, three 20-minute times a week, fully 20 minutes, that doesn't include transition, you know, dropping up and picking up. That's really, and then we would look at just through the schedule. It does not, it's not the same world language um, instructional time being 20 minutes. It's not the same as our regular allied R, our other allied R's, which we don't even really look at world language really as allied R's. I mean, it's, it's not like a 45 minute block of our music, the Z um, Media Center. So that's where we have to get really creative. Julie Nickerson is a master at scheduling. And, um, you know, we've gone around and around trying to make this fit. Um, and, you know, 
with, you know, I agree with that. With additional staffing, it would help. But again, going back to when we sit together, make the decisions, and look at the big picture, and we have to, you know, that's why we have this process. And I might suggest another lens to look through it. You know, when we have, uh, you know, set periodic curriculum reviews and as well as updates on the strategic plan, um, you know, we need to ask what are we doing? Are we implementing the plan? And then the second question should be, are we doing it well? So at some point we can say, yeah, we are, we do offer foreign language to more grades, but when we look at curriculum needs, for the district, it may be that may not be a high priority as other areas, and you, you know you can't do it every year. But when we review curriculum, I think that's a big part of it. Are we? What are we doing? And more importantly, are we doing it well? And how might those priorities have to change? So I think um, you know that's to I mispronounce your name, but to, um, Madame. Chase, um, you know, that's a great question. So when we look at that, you know, what, what, how, you know, we can control the schedule. So what's the best way to uh, schedule the curriculum for student needs and what's the priority? And that's part of getting feedback. This is great to get our feedback. And as we look at curriculum in those different areas, that should be a big component. Are we doing it just to do it? Or are we doing it well? So. I, you know, I don't think we can answer all those questions in a budget workshop, but that might be one area. I'd like, I'd like to add on to something that Susanna said. If I understand correctly, the way decisions are made is the district leadership team, yes, there is principals and people for each schools, but nobody, we have one district. So when each principal talks for their school, they still have to talk with the other principal. We have one fund of money, one budget. And there may be a higher priority for the district as a whole to put something in middle school or high school or Pond Cove. And that's where each principal comes with their, uh, their list. And then it has to get decided as a group what can we afford as a district and what works best in our district. And a, a rubric we used to use when we had uh, somebody for a year was must-haves, would like to haves, and would be great, but we can sacrifice it. You have to prioritize each of the needs. So it would be nice to maybe to have um, world language five days a week for X amount of time, but there are other d demands on our money and demands on the time and demands on, and that's what the district le leadership team does. It has to work out what's in the best interest of the school district as a whole. While I'm sure everybody advocates for their school, you still have to, you still have to look at the fact that it's one district and these kids are all going to be in all three schools at some point, hopefully. So. Thank you, David. Uh, anyone have any more questions at this time for for Kelly? If not, we'll move on to. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Does anyone have any more questions at this time? I will go through uh, instructional support. Good evening. Um, we're in the section that's entitled instructional support. I've taken mine apart, but y'all can find it. I'm sure. Um, this is a very short. Um, presentation but I'll elaborate a little bit on the positions. We are currently operating with what you see here projected for next year. So we currently, and you know that any given day the number fluctuates by one or two in the, the actual enrollment in special education. Um, but as of this moment right now there are 155 students that we're serving. Um, we plan to serve approximately the exact same number in the fall, given the projections that we have, our incoming kindergartners coming into us from Child Development Services identified, the ones we know about, we have nine and we're losing um, just about the same number at the other end in the high school. So our numbers remain pretty safe and pretty um, stagnant. That's not to say that we won't have some move-ins and some move-outs just like everyone else. We currently have and are projecting to have 15 special educators. There are five special educators at the elementary school, four special educators at the middle school, and currently there are five special educators at the high school. We have Ms. Broussard, Elaine Broussard, who's on leave this year. She is returning next year. She will be one of our special educators next year. We have one 
K-8 instructional strategist. That is Cheryl Joyce. That is a person who is responsible for the oversight of the IEP process. She is the um, only teacher in the district who has administrative oversight and can participate in IEP meetings as an administrator. Ben Raymond is the team leader, the um, department head, I'm what you call, at the high school, and he has um, significant oversight of that process up there, um, but does not currently want to have, nor does he have the um, administrative oversight. So administrators are attending IEPs. Um, we currently have 19 educational technicians. There are nine at the elementary school seven at the uh, middle school and four at the high school. <coughs> we have four speech therapists. That's a lot of speech and language pathologists in our district. We have 1.5 at the elementary school, 1.5 at the middle school, and one full-time <coughs> speech and language pathologist at the high school. We have two psychologists in our budget four days each, that shows here as 1.8. Two additional days of their time is currently and would be currently next year funded through the federal funds that we receive, the local entitlement. So that puts two full-time psychologists here five days a week for each one of them. Um, Dr. Alina Perez is a clinical psychologist and Laura Manuel is a um, school psychologist and she's also a certified board <coughs> certified behavior analyst or commonly known as a BCBA. Laura is on leave this year. She's contracted with us as a BCBA 10 hours a week. She missed the month of January for family medical reasons. We have two full-time occupational therapists. One occupational therapist serves Pong Cove exclusively. The other serves grades 5 through 12. We have a part-time 0.5 projected physical therapist. Um, that may wiggle a little bit looking on our numbers. We're never really sure. Um, at the moment, 0.5 would serve the children we have, um, but it may indeed end up being a 0.6. We're not 100% sure of that. Um, but the funding, should that need to increase, would come from local entitlement, the federal funds. Special education currently supports 2.5 social workers. Two half-time social workers at the high school are supported by local entitlement. Um, one is local entitlement monies and one is um, district monies. We have one full-time social worker at the middle school and a .5 social worker at the elementary school supported through special education. There are, there's also a full-time social worker at the high school and a full-time social worker at Pong Cove, supported by those budgets. Um, that team has become a very strong team of um, service providers who do support the social and emotional needs of all of our students, K-12. Um, social work services are available to any and all students. And you see the projection of the point five director. So the conversation has been that the current position that I hold, and this is not about Jane, this is about a, a position. Um, the current position oversees, as you know, special education, ELL, um, gifted and talented, uh, also acts as the affirmative action officer. Um, and Section 504 is the District Section 504 Coordinator. The um, conversation is projected that the Special Education Director, the title would change, um, would be responsible for Special Education and Section 504. The other duties, the um, Affirmative Action would move on to the Business Office and the HR person, and the Gifted and Talented and the ELL would move over to Ruth Ellen Bond, Director of Instruction. There is no intention and no plan for any of the responsibilities of the director of special education as she sits now or as he or she would sit in the future um, being passed on to teachers. So the responsibilities are administrative that the director of special education um, would accomplish for the district and so um, it would remain that way. 
Am I supposed to do something with that? What's this? Mm -hmm. it's a job description. I guess you're getting a sample job description mm -hmm. coming. Right. Yeah. That's okay. Um, so there is a list here in your narrative that's provided to you about the services that special education provides. And we provide the full range of services here by Maine state regulations and in full compliance with those regulations. I'm, I'm sorry, Jane, may I interrupt you and um, ask you to just repeat mm -hmm. um, what you said about the responsibilities and how those change? Oh, okay. So currently, I am responsible for special education, ELL, gifted and talented, affirmative action, Section 504, that's five things. Special. And then, you know, we throw in the psych and the social workers and all that, but that's just part of special ed, okay? So the projection is that the special education director will be responsible for special education and Section 504. And the rest will go to um, the GT and the ELL will go to Ms. Vaughn, the director of instruction. And the um, affirmative action will go over to the HR person. Can you tell us a bit more about what an affirmative action, what those job duties entail? Mm -hmm. So yeah. whenever there's a complaint from um, a staff or a student about harassment, be it sexual or just regular harassment, or um, a complaint from a, a personnel about a hostile work environment, mm -hmm. uh, or, or a person is very uncomfortable and doesn't feel like going to their supervisor, often that investigation and that um, search for all the information to help us figure it out falls to the affirmative action officer. That means usually that it requires the person doing that to drop everything and and devote days solely to that investigation um, to gather all the material, talk to all the people, um, keep it as highly confidential as uh, it must be, and write a report which is given to the superintendent and then the affirmative action officer is done with that and it moves on then for the superintendent to act upon. And are those types of responsibilities normally something a human resource officer is especially trained to do? It seems highly sensitive. Yes. Okay. In my previous um, positions, I've shared that in the role, that is similar to the role I have mm -hmm. here, along with our business manager in other districts. So okay. that is common. Thank you. Is there any way you can characterize what portion of your time is, is you would estimate is allocated to those different responsibilities? Um, it's never a daily equal opportunity right. for each one of those. <laughs> so um, I can say that the number of affirmative action investigations that I've done in my tenure here are probably two, maybe three a year. Um, time devoted to ELL is, is not significant in, in that ELL is, is um, Could you please explain what ELL English is? English language learners, second language, sorry. Um, so that's one teacher and it's not a huge amount of time, but it's, it's highly important. And um, the kinds of programming and the kinds of um, instructional practices that we've been looking at together along with um, each of our buildings has been important as we've made a shift from a very much traditional pull-out program that she had been doing to a more integrated, um, inclusive model and a more um, supportive model of, of making sure our young people have every opportunity that they should have and, and aren't missing opportunities by being pulled out into a separate space. Um, gifted and talented, as uh, any one of my colleagues can tell you, um, <coughs> Ms. Hassan and Dr. Tracy can tell you that gifted and talented have um, consumed a significant amount of all of our time this year and will continue to do so for, I suspect, a couple more years until um, people are comfortable with the process and the practices and um, are working on that. 
I can tell you that special education can consume my days 100% of the time. Um, it all depends on um, my responsibilities there. If they are IEP driven and I am responsible for attending IEPs, then that is a significant amount of time that I spend that um, building administrators are not spending. Um, I, at the moment, am solely responsible for supervising and evaluating special educators. And in my experience, that's not been my practice elsewhere. Um, it has been a shared opportunity um, for a couple reasons. One, I don't live in the buildings day to day with every single person. Um, and, and building principals do, and, they, and special educators should be included as part of their faculty and staff in, in every way that everyone else is. Um, and two, the, the, the good news about a special education director sharing that supervision is that a, a special education director has a background in special education. And so together, collaboratively, we could bring a very nice, um, supportive, um, supervision and evaluation process and that has been my practice in the past. It, when I arrived here it was a very separate process and it remains that. So I solely at this moment provide all the supervision and evaluation, meaning the evaluation pieces. I don't supervise day to day who goes to lunch duty, but um, for the most part all of that human resource piece I do. So as we look to um, a part-time or a half-time director, that supervision and evaluation process would be shared. And I understand the challenge of that. I also understand the joy of it and the positiveness of that for staff and having them be included and part of um, the faculty. They will sit there and shake their heads no to me. I know that. But, um, I, I understand that that's worrisome to people, but the reality is it's a great model and it works really well when folks are really collaborating on it. Sorry, Jane, who did you say you would chair the um, evaluations with or that the supervision? That would be the building principals. Oh, okay. Yeah. And or the assistant principals mm -hmm. with the evaluation mm -hmm. pieces. However it's happening in the buildings, the process is to be that we have um, three awesome principals and three awesome assistant principals, and so um, we have a lot of administrators, and it makes sense that we could share that. So, looking at the benefits, I definitely see uh, benefits from having, you know, if you look at the ben cost benefit analysis and say, okay, a benefit would be that even if you didn't have a half time director, there could be a potential benefit from having building principals um, do supervision. So that's a decision that could be made or considered without um, uh, if it's a full-time or half-time director because they're going to be doing more of it. They're not doing it now, so it doesn't matter who, who did it before. Um, and, you know, I can see uh, that that would be one benefit. Um, what are some other benefits um, from transitioning supervision and evaluation to the principals and contrast that with some of the costs of, um, you know, if someone's only in the district half time, you know, scheduling to meet with them, you know, just to help us understand a little bit both sides of, of the supervision piece only. So for the supervision piece, it, it, it you might say to me that you per would perceive that I do that part-time now anyway because I'm not landed in a building. So I am scheduling, I have just finished scheduling three weeks of back-to-back -back observations with people um, and I'm running between three buildings to accomplish that, which is not tremendously effective of my time, but it's very supportive of their time because I say to them, you choose and you let me know and then I show up. Um, so, in that way, I don't see that as any different for a half-time person because along the way I'm doing other things as I wend my way between schools and, and bump into folks and am and, um, and working. Um, the positives of that would be that 
we expect that our instructional practices are differentiated, just like our regular educators. All of our special educators have participated in all of the PD that's been provided for regular education. Um, and we, we want them to be able to be in classrooms and to collaborate with teachers. And so to have principals' eyes on that is very productive, I think. Um, I'm just uh, just wanting to be led through the the IEP um, process since that's been raised um, quite a bit lately and from um, parents. Um, so so if you're dividing the supervision, um, who, who who is the team? So let's say it would be it could be you or it could be two of you together or would you definitely like break down the caseload? Would be would you on one? And principal on another? So IEP teams are consistent consist of an administrator. So that could be an assistant principal, a principal, or m me, or a director, or it could be um, the instructional strategist that I mentioned. She has administrative oversight. Then you have a group of teachers, special educator, regular mm -hmm. educators, support personnel that would be needed for that specific child's mm -hmm. service. Okay. And then the administrator who is on that team mm -hmm. um, may or may not, I guess it depends, depends if it's you or one of the principals, has the, a background in special ed, is that right? And, and how does that, you know, if they're the supervisor, how does that get played out if, if their background isn't special ed? So for the IEP process, they all have had the basics in special education, they've all had um, basic special education law and basic special education practice that we've spent a significant amount of time together talking mm -hmm. about and providing them time with um, Eric Hurl and our attorney. So the IEP process really doesn't require an administrator to be a special educator because we have special educators in the, on the teams. It really requires someone that understands the process and can manage the process in a way that is productive uses people's time appropriately, um, and make sure that we come out with a, a document that we all feel we can reach consensus on. Mm -hmm. So that really doesn't f connect into the supervision and evaluation process necessarily. <laughs> so a as a follow-up to that mm -hmm. then, in the supervision and evaluation process, mm -hmm. would you be dividing um, your 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 directs between a building administrator and this part-time director's position? And one person would take this number of people, and another person would take another number of people. Or would you, in collaboration, be evaluating and supervising each staff member so that? The supervision and evaluation is a team between you, the director and the building administrator. So, well, I was just going to say, I'm going to speak to that a little bit only because we're working on our supervision and evaluation plan. So that's still a work in progress. Well, um, so does but, the supervision and evaluation plan cover special ed and techs as well? Well, again, this, uh, I, mean, I can't speak to Jane's experience. I will say this is the first place that I've worked to where building administrators haven't had supervisory oversight for special education staff. Okay. Um, so I, I think as Jane described it, it would be a shared oversight. Um, we're talking about 27, 20, a little under 27 professional staff members, I think if I counted correctly. Um, divided by six administrators, that's four to five additional people per administrator. Our evaluation plan right now is likely to call for, and again, we haven't made any final decisions on this, but for annual evaluation of probationary staff, and every three-year basis, a, for a summative evaluation for our continuing professional staff. So if you think about those 27 people, only nine are really being formally evaluated in a, any given year on an ongoing basis. So, you know, the, the burden of that, I don't believe from an administrator perspective when it's part of your ongoing work is going to be particularly cumbersome. Um, so that's that piece. But I uh, model as well, really that collaboration tends to come around you know, when you're growing new people, 
um, or when you're addressing concerns, then you are spending more time together really working on that. And, and again, with continuing contract people, most of that is around their, their self-directed professional growth. So I think a question for, uh, you know, if you're, you know, uh, we can go through the roles, but also as a, a director of a, um, you know, if it's, if I'm the special director, um, you know, there's a lot of different things I do. And, you know, I imagine they pull all the pieces together. So, um, you know, there's, you know, special educators, ed tech, speech therapists, psychology, psychology services, like occupational therapy, physical therapy, social work. Um, so I understand where building principles could help in terms of teacher evaluation, but maybe help me understand uh, how a half-time position would, you know, be able to pull all the pieces together given this is a very, um, you know, each student's needs are very different. And, you know, like I've said before, it's the most challenging part of being a school board member is understanding instructional support. So how, you know, how would a half-time person? So I can share a direct experience. And I was a special education director before I came to this district. And my job included um, oversight for special education for approximately 350 students from pre-K through age 21. Um, who were receiving special education supports and services. It included oversight for English language learners, Section 504. Um, uh, I oversaw um, Title I programming, um, and I also oversaw humanities curricula. And um, our, we had the equivalent of two um, instructional strategists in the district um, for that number of students. And so, you know, I didn't have direct oversight for supervision and evaluation of all of those teachers. I did collaborate with administrators for some of that supervision, but um, in a similarly high-performing district with the kids with the same, a similar diversity of needs and similar challenges, um, I, I think we had pretty good capacity working as a collaborative administrative team to manage those needs. And I, I feel, again, that we have a strong administrative team with strong backgrounds and experiences, a strong staff, and I, I don't see it as, as a significant impact. We have a building assistant principal who is head special education administrator. In the past, all of our administrators have been required to take school law as well as special education law. All of them have had a variety of experiences sitting in and facilitating um, individual education plan meetings. Uh, again, I think we have a competent group of people, and I'm not concerned. Um, you know, I will say as a special education director, I can't think of a situation where there was a true emergation director was needed in that moment um, to answer a specific question that, that we weren't able to answer to or do the research for. Typically, if there's a situation when the director's not there and you need the director there, you stop the meeting and you reschedule for when the director is going to be there. Um, so I, I'm not anxious that we don't have um, the support and knowledge within our group to absorb um, this shift. Jane, um, can you, do you uh, agree with uh, Meredith, and I was based on your experience in this district, do you, do you agree with her? Mm -hmm. we, especially the piece about the emergency, and, and it's, it's not uncommon to have someone say to me, we need an emergency meeting, and, and the, the, the definition of emergency is somebody's anxiety has reached something and so there's usually a conversation about that and we figure it out but there are no emergencies that require um, a human being to stop everything they're doing drop it and run to to sit down at a meeting with someone um, so the reality is that we try to be really thoughtful and practiced about what we're doing. We try to schedule things so they make sense for, for moms and dads and staff and everyone else. Um, the challenge sometimes comes between the administrators and, and um, the high school is a good example where Mr. Carpenter in the morning spends his mornings with substitute settling and Mr. Shedd is um, otherwise engaged often in other meetings and so many times I am the administrator that's there but we do that in a, in a thoughtful way we schedule that so that we're not just 
looking at each other every morning saying who's up I mean it's not it's not like that so I, I guess what I was looking at was um, Meredith gave a good description about the talent uh, she thinks people bring to the table and then mm -hmm. she mentioned the particular talents in this district district and um, I'm just looking for a if I if you were a doctor I'd be asking or a lawyer I'd be asking for a second opinion so mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that her views correspond with what your views and your actual practice in the district for at least for two years now, three years? Three. Three. Three and a half. Because she gave a long dissertation, not just about emergencies, but all kinds of support and all <laughs> kinds of expertise. Yes. Do you agree? I do. I do. We have, um, you know, K-8, Miss Joyce, is an extremely competent <coughs> teacher leader of special education. Um, there are times when the regulations can be befuddling to any of us. And I've tried to read them. She, <laughs> we, we all try to read them. <laughs> and then we go back and read them again. Um, and then we go ask Cheryl. So um, that really is, the, you know, she is very good at that. She's very good at facilitating meetings. She's very good at drawing in people's expertise and making sure that everyone has what they need at these meetings. Um, we have the same situation at the high school with our special educators. I, I would say to you that I've watched them grow wonderfully in their abilities to facilitate, not only facilitate the IEPs, but to actually have them come to fruition in a very timely manner and in compliance, which is a wonderful thing. Um, I guess Mr. Shedd could speak to his experiences facilitating his IEPs with the staff, as could um, Mike and Kelly, but um, I, people have, have really stepped up now. That brings up the question that is lurking here somewhere, sitting around in the back, um, right here beside me, and that is um, people are working too hard, they have too much to do. So... Do we need to chime out because we have to flip the chair? We have to flip. Oh, so you should all stand up and wiggle. You've been sitting here a very long time. Take a break. I'm going to take that off. What a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> I don't need to sit down anymore either. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have no idea. Two ones. It's like that must be the old one. Director of no. instruction. Is that was the law? Oh no, it's Ruth Allen. Yeah. So we're gonna play Neil Diamond for the seventh inning. Oh, that'd be Sweet. good. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think we'll end it at Yeah, that's pretty good. I like that. Um, Nicely done. It's Is it done? Yeah. Oh, it's hard You're to done? stop in this topic of this time. He's got one more flip on that new tip. We've reached the end of his contract hours. He's out. It's gone. Stop driving my cars. Right. <laughs> there. We're going to start again in two minutes. Boy, you can move John from back. Damn it, with my. Mm. My poor mother fell down in the park and broke her hand and cracked her head up and texted with my sister who was evaluating her. Yes, it does. As a matter of fact, I must have treated her. I'll pull her back so you can grab me on the camera. Crack skull. Well, mm. crack skull. Paris mm. mm. contusions. Bleeding mm. profusely. They sent her home in her car. She had a very lovely job. She had a broken heart. If I were a lawyer, I would call them. Oh, my. There's only one problem. Interesting. They're a client of my firm. Well, I'm not in the firm anymore. As usual. My sister is ready to go in there and choke her. Oh, my God. They sent her home with aspirin, no drugs, a splint. She had a cut mm -hmm. and she was on Coumadin, so she was basically doing this for her. I was going to say, aspirin without obviously consent, but also with a head injury. It's and, like asking for it. And they didn't scan her. She's 89 years old. They didn't do any scan of her head. They said, do you have a headache? She goes, no. And, okay, what plan is that acceptable? I mean, my sister... My sister took her back for a scan? Uh, that's a good question. She's taking her into the dark. Right oh, my, my, 
We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so um, this will be brief. I, I just want to share a perspective as a special education teacher and, and administrator. And in the middle, I was a Cheryl Joyce kind of person. So um, I began practicing special education when President Ford signed the law. Um, and at that time, special education teachers were very few and far between, and we all thought that we were going to fix it. And we were practicing what was called the medical model, where we would take you down the hall and we would do something. And we, we had no forms. The state hadn't awakened to the joy of making forms. And so we made them. And we documented things on forms, and we had a great time. And then after three or four years of trying to schedule children around elementary school, wonderful things like art, music, PE, and regular classes, and then to schedule meetings around multiple things, and then to have meetings and make the forms, it began to um, dawn on us that this job required more than just the joy of teaching, which is what we all started in the profession to do. So special education has just grown since then, and it is a job that requires multiple responsibilities from educators. First and foremost, yes, they are teachers. But secondly, they have the same responsibility, the same weight of responsibility for teaching as they do for the compliance paperwork responsibility part of their job. And in this district, historically, for a while, you had strategists at your elementary school, strategists at the middle school, and one at the high school. Um, when I arrived, the position at the high school wasn't working really well, and so we struggled with that for a year and made some changes. Um, we worked on that at the elementary school for a couple years, and it became evident that the kinds of responsibilities that a strategist were doing, that Miss Joyce was really able to do the K-8 and that we needed the person that was in the special education strategist position to teach. At the same time, we realized that all of our special educators weren't at the same place of understanding not only the reason for the paperwork and the <coughs> compliance, and there is a reason for it, and it's a good reason, um, but they also were a little bit confused about how to. So we've spent a tremendous amount of time with them on that, and we still do. We provide them with all the help we possibly can so that they can not only understand the process, feel good about the paperwork they're completing, and feel good that they are responsible and, and in compliance with that. Because compliance is as important today as it was the first year that we started special education <coughs> way back in the early 70s. So, yes, I understand that the job they have has more than one hat. It's one of those baseball hats with three brims and you spin it around. And so I'm teacher, I'm a paperwork person, responsible, and then the third part of that is I'm communicator. And we heard tonight some of us aren't doing a great job of that. That's okay, we can always get better at that and it's not okay we're not doing a good job of it, I don't mean that. But the communication is two ways. One way is with moms and dads, but the other piece of communication that's hugely responsible on our special educators is with our general educators. And if they're not communicating with general education, then we are teaching young people in isolation the way I used to do that back in the early 70s. And that's not the way we want our children taught. So it makes somebody feel split, I understand that, and it makes them busy, yes it does, but our teachers who are teaching first grade, second grade, all the way up through high school are just as busy. They're just busy in a different way. 
And so when the school year started, we made a very focused choice to have every special educator be responsible for 10 students' IEP process, that compliance piece. As the year has gone on, as we predicted, that's shaken up a little bit. Some have seven, some have 12. Um, nobody has an exorbitant caseload. All of our surrounding districts that we benchmark with, Cumberland, Yarmouth, Falmouth, and um, Gorham to some degree, Yarmouth being the closest to us, their caseloads, let's wrote this down. They have a 12 to 5 ratio. They're carrying caseloads. Um, they have 16 special educators and they carry 150 students. So that's the closest to Cape Elizabeth with our 155 and our 15 teachers. And our ratio is a little smaller. Um, Falmouth, Cumberland, and um, Gorham all carry in the 200s. Cumberland up almost to 300 students. Falmouth 258, according to their director. Um, so we aren't out of the norm here. We aren't, we're working hard. People are doing a great job. Can they do better? We all can do better. But the reality is that being a special educator requires some different activities than just a classroom teacher's responsibility, which is huge. Everybody's busy. I'm curious, in, I actually, you said we're not out of the norm. If I heard the math correctly, in just ratios of um, students with special ed, we're actually at the higher end, aren't we? Higher end. Better, a good. Oh, we have mm. a great ratio here. Mm. Right. Yes, we do. We should be very proud of that. And I, it isn't just a, and secondly, it isn't just a function of numbers. It's, you could have an uh, eight to one ratio, but have eight really serious kids that need a lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's also a function of the mm -hmm. type of need. Yeah. Uh, and I, I assume that our relative mix of, I, I honestly don't know all the issues that we have, but I'll say autism. We have, we have about the same issues of uh, or needs mix as Yarmouth or Cumberland. Cumberland has a higher population of some very needy young people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gorham does too. If anyone, well, this is time to open it up. If anyone has questions, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna. Uh, I heard some questions and comments about our overall staffing levels, so I had pulled out the 2011-12 budget, which was the budget before I came. But mm -hmm. at the time, um, there were 15 special education teachers in the budget. Um, 1.8 psychologists. We've increased that to two. 1.6 social workers. We've increased that to 2.5. One occupational therapist. We now have two two speech pathologists, and we now have four. Um, so, you know, I know there was a concern that, boy, we're just cutting special education teachers and we're not looking at needs and we're not addressing that, but I think what we have done is flexed some of those other supports driven by our student needs. For example, speech and language services were an area that we focused on increasing because we were seeing a number of students with autism who had needs for pragmatic language support. Um, so. So we have seen an increase in staffing, even though we've seen in that same time period an, a reduction from 180 kids at the time um, that this was budgeted in 2011-12 right. to 153 that we're projecting for next year. Correct. Yes. Um, to either of you, um, I, I'm just wondering, um, you know, understanding the sort of the breakup of some of the roles to more than just you, more and then to <clears throat> spread it out and the benefits of that. I, I still, I guess, I'd like to understand that why not reallocate, you know, the savings towards something that can just benefit even more the, the program. Um, I guess I'm not understanding why we wouldn't just, okay, for switching, if we're breaking up the responsibilities to more than one person, therefore making one position half time, why not still? Wouldn't it be, make it even stronger to keep that, that, fu that funding in other pockets of the same program of special ed, if I'm making sense? Um, um, yes mm -hmm. and no. So let's like, say the savings we're getting in, I hate to put it that way, but in, in the, the part-time director, yeah. um, and given um, you know, maybe the, the stretch uh, thin component of um, maybe Pond Cove families in particular with younger kids who need more hands-on, 
um, why wouldn't why wouldn't we use the half time savings, half time job savings, and and push it towards maybe more hiring one more special ed teacher, sure. for example. I, mean, I think you can look at our investment at, at our investment in preschool as a, if you want to, if you choose to frame it that way as a reallocation of savings. We know that um, early investment in education pays off at about a three to one. Um, <laughs> cost benefit uh, based on years of research that have been conducted in, in early childhood education. So I, I think in that sense, there is a reallocation of those funds to target our students with disabilities. And I know we're probably not going to get to preschool tonight, um, but to, to begin providing services to them at a younger age so that they are more prepared when they begin to access services in the district. Um, it's not it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's, it's a shift. Um, but again, I think it's a you know, as we look at the adjustment of the director position and as the board considers that, I think it's a place where we have some capacity. And I do think that investment in preschool is a good move for the district. Susanna, so, I, I, I'm going to, I understand the problem when, when people do this with budgets is you see a savings here, why can't we plow it back into this program? It's not an apple to apple. We, we have one pool of money. If we really need it, the real question here is are we short handed in, in instructional support. If we are, then we'll go ask for more money from the taxpayers. Okay, it's, yeah. There's not a direct connection. Which if, ties back to my earlier question with Kelly, uh, you know, like, let's remind people that, you know, these, these decisions are made collaboratively. Right, exactly. So if, you know, so I would ask all three of, you know, the principals, are we okay with this? You know, are you okay with, with this? Because ultimately, you know, I know this comes not just from you know, your, your two voices. It comes from all of the feedback. And um, so I, I, I do realize that, but I think it does come back to that point. Um, you know. I, I agree. I, I, the question is, if, if we're too thin, we'll find the money in many places. Let, and let us tax know base, we, we have to. That's right. Yeah. I'm sure there's lots of questions um, from different board members. You know, so... Uh, I'm sure there'll be follow-up requests. Um, I think getting comparables, I'll keep a list, would be um, great in terms of, uh, as a school board member, we're in isolation, so I'll keep a list, but why don't we open up the questions now, John? Oh, okay. I thought you were wrapping. I thought you were wrapping. Oh, no, no, I'm just saying <laughs> we there. We weren't going to let you sit No, down. no, 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 we're just getting started. Uh, but I just want to say, I'm, I'm sure there'll be questions um, so it's going to seem disorganized. This is how it works. But, you know, board members should, uh, there's a lot of different questions, issues here. So um, I wish there was an easy, efficient way to do it. But the best way is just for each of us to ask questions. And um, I'll try to keep a running total of what I hear as follow-up or additional information questions. So, John, do you have a... Well, so I, yes, I wanted to shift gears a little bit from the from the director position to the, the staffing, which Meredith began to do by pointing out what I noticed too. And in the, in the, if you look at the long, the, the the longer term history of staffing and instructional support, that there's been some significant investment, despite declining enrollment and in instructional support, some significant increases in the various different s staffing positions. Nonetheless, we we look we we compare budgets typically this year to the year before, mm -hmm. and there are um, reductions in staffing. So, can you just di directly address that issue of um, how this how are we going to meet this, the needs of the students as defined by their IEP and 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 also by our ambitions for them and our central goal of closing the achievement gap. Um, with the, the staffing levels that are proposed. So at the high school this year, Ms. Broussard went on leave and that left an opening. And we looked at the numbers and quite frankly weren't sure if we needed someone or not, so we waited a little bit. Then we decided we needed someone and we advertised and we found no one. Um, so we filled that position, that opening, with a .5 literacy specialist to work not only with um, 
our young people in the in our special education setting, not as a special educator, but as a literacy specialist, but mostly to work with our regular education English teachers. Um, and since then, um, that person has branched out to other uh, content areas. So the number of young people that we had at the high school to start the year that we had planned on having six teachers for, we had five, and we served, we were fine. And we remain fine to this day. Um, the middle school is the school that started out with five teachers and then um, one of those teachers succeeded in um, landing a nice administrative job in another district. Um, so, you know, that wasn't a great move on our, we missed her, um, but the reality is it was a great opportunity for her. We advertised twice, we interviewed twice, we found no one to fill that position. By the second interview team, um, Mike and I and some regular educator and special educators met with the candidate that we had <laughs> and made a decision that it didn't make sense to bring someone in, that quite frankly all of the students were being served, caseloads were not huge. Um, and so since that person left the middle school, we have reassigned students to different special educators and they have been served all year. That's the same number of students that we're anticipating for next year. So the reality is that what we have right now, all students are being served and there isn't a need to fill in another person. And I don't know quite how else to explain that. I, I guess what he's asked is, are they served well? I mean, is, are we providing a good quality? Well, now we're going to go, I'm not going to dive into individual personnel issues or individual children and some of the things that I as well heard tonight. Um, what I can say to you is that I don't have any, any special educator working with more than three or four young people without an educational technician or two there. I can tell you that we have speech and language pathologists and occupational therapists in the same room with special educators multiple parts of days. Um, so are they served well? I believe they are. Um, do we have services that overlap? Yes, we do. Do we have um, teams of people that are working on behalf of some of our more needy young people? Yes, we do. Do we have some young people who simply come for some support in a study hall? Absolutely, and they're receiving that support as well. So I wouldn't have <laughs> suggested this. I, in a, I wouldn't have suggested by any stretch that we would reduce the number of special educators if we needed them. I worked very hard to get the four speech and language pathologists into this district and that is a huge, in my opinion, huge accomplishment for our children, K-12. Um, communication and the ability to communicate to function once one goes on, no matter where they're going on to, whether it's from kindergarten to first grade or from 12th grade to the adult services, if you can't communicate in today's world, you're in real trouble. And we have discovered not only our young people with autism, but some of our other young people with other disabilities, be they emotional or um, significant learning disabilities are having difficulty expressing themselves in a way that is going to help them be successful in the world. So f I know that four speech and language pathologists is about three more than another district this size might have. They probably might have one and a half, but the reality is we weren't serving our children well with speech and language services, and we are now in multiple ways. It's not just pull out, come sit with me and we'll talk. It's in classrooms. It's where the world is happening that they need to be working with the young people and that's what's happening with our speech and language pathologists. So that service has increased significantly. The same thing is with occupational therapy. We have one full-time occupational therapist at the elementary school. Wow. She can be in every classroom. She has some very um, wonderful opportunities to integrate and to, to share with teachers some strategies and skills. She's doing a great job with that. 
She also has some young people there that she needs to spend a significant amount of time with. And she can because she's not running around the rest of the district. That's awesome. Another district would tell you you only needed one K-12. And, and if, we, if we were to find through uh, the IEP process at the beginning of next year that we had insufficient uh, special education resources to address mm -hmm. um, the student need. How, how would we deal with that at that time? Well, we'd have a conversation. My, my <laughs> you may you remember I when I arrived that there was some budgetary challenges and that the Office of Special Education carried two full-time secretaries and we do not now have any secretarial support. Um, and that was because the local entitlement, the federal funds, had been allocated, um, stretched a bit too far, so we had to make some adjustments. Through the past couple of years, we have managed those funds really well, and we have now a significant carryover that goes forward every year, so that if we got to a place next fall where we needed another teacher, there would be enough federal funds to provide that teacher. So it wouldn't be that I would come running back to you all and say, oh my gosh, you got to find $70,000 now or whatever a teacher costs. Also why we created a contingency fund too. Yeah. We, we sort of hang on to that though for those young people that might need something really special. But um, there are federal funds that would be available to support that. So it's not a question of if you may, if you decide that this is what you want to support, and then all of a sudden something happens, you don't have any any way to go around that. You do. Jay, maybe common a, a common thread. Um, you know, we have this list: of speech therapists, psychologists, services, occupational therapy, physical therapy, social work. Uh, you know, a common position, or maybe it's not a position. Was you know, behavioral specialist, behavioral therapist. Uh, maybe, you know, we heard feedback from, uh, you know, different people on this. Maybe it would be helpful just to, you know, how, what is our philosophy and staffing strategy to meet the behavioral needs of students and, you know, how might have that changed over the last few years just to give us some context to assess um, different models and maybe, uh, you know, just to help us walk, walk us through that area or those types of needs. So when I arrived here, this district employed um, a contracted service for about $40,000 of a, a applied behavioral analysis um, young man who was a BCBA, that um, board certified behavior analyst who came in from another agency, actually um, a couple days a week. And um, at the same time, we had some staff that were interested in learning more. So those, that staff began doing their coursework and this behavior analyst kept working and there were a couple other <coughs> psychologists that came and went during that time and, and provided consultation services in addition to the two that we had. Um, as those folks took their courses, this district provided their supervision, meaning we hired another contracted service to support them as they learned. Um, we reduced that contracted service once one of our special educators attained the BCBA credential. Um, the other two continued to be certified. One took the board test this summer and passed. One had not taken the board test, um, and that is the one that has left our position and moved on to the administration. Um, so. At, at that point, one of our psychologists, beginning last year, full-time psychologist, is a BCBA. That's a full-time person here in our district. Um, we have continued to provide some consultation services from other folks as needed. We have that flexibility because we have um, the funds <coughs> in local entitlement. Our federal funds are available for that. So in this budget, looking in 2015-16, and if they're not categorized as this, I understand it, behavioral therapist, strategist, you know, how many do we have now, 
you know, um, I just get their sense there. The perception I have is there used to be this role, and now this role doesn't exist, you know, based on some comments at Pond so, Cove. So the word behavior strategist does not exist. It did the first year I was here as that teacher grew into the position and wanted to, to expand to be a BCBA. Um, and that person had innate skills and some very good skills that she had learned. Um, that position, that name went away that after that first year as people worked toward their credential. And so right now, one of the two psychologists that you see, although it's listed as psychologist, is also a BCBA. So we have a behaviorist in the district who serves children K-12. This year, she is she's on leave, so she's only here 10 hours a week. Could you just review quickly <clears throat> what the role is for a behaviorist in the district? Are they an intervention with students, or are they more in line with um, helping assess a student and their students' needs? <coughs> Great question. Thank you. They assess, and then they work with the team of professionals who work with the student. They may indeed do some work with the student. That they're not there to intervene for emergency situations, are they? Not usually, but historically that has been the um, practice and the expectation. Okay. Um, and therein lies our challenge a bit. Um, you heard tonight that, yes, indeed, there, one parent was correct. I have just contracted with a, a person who comes to us specifically for young people with autism, but also um, is a BCBA among her many other credentials. And um, the staff, their hearts are great. And they said to me, so how is it we get the kids to her? And I said, no, 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 no. She works with the teams. She's here for us as adults to help us know how to work with the children because we're here every day and she's not. Um, and so the real challenge is to have the skill set to know what to do and then have the skill set to give it away so that my colleague, the teacher, knows what to do when I've walked out the door to do something else. Otherwise, <laughs> we'd be hiring people who, all people who were behaviors to just do with the children, and that really isn't going to serve us well, or children well. So I just, I hear frustration and concern from parents in the community that students who need intervention for behavior outburst or, or, or however you want to characterize mm -hmm. that, on a, on a surprise basis on a, in a given day. How are those students who need behavioral therapy being served well in our district? So they all have a team of people. They don't just have a teacher. They have a special educator. They have a classroom teacher, a special educator, more than likely an occupational therapist, a speech and language pathologist, and a social worker. Mm -hmm. And they have plans in place and even the best laid plans are not going to mitigate every single behavior. And so a behavior happens, and then there has to be a plan on how we're going to work through it and then move on so that it can be a learning experience. Those are frustrating times. There is <coughs> nothing that will get anyone's attention quicker than behaviors. And nothing that frustrates anyone more than that because people feel Oh my gosh, I didn't know what to do. Oh my gosh, I felt so bad for the young person because he, she was not being successful. And that's hard. And then one last question on the behavioral therapist, because it's a question that we have gotten several mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. And I apologize for not being here mm -hmm. for the meeting where you had a workshop around instructional support. It's okay. But one of the issues that also continues to arise is the difference between practices as they have evolved in in what you do with a student who is in crisis. So if mm -hmm. you could walk us through, I'm sure, one more time, mm -hmm. if there is a student in an active crisis, how is that student um, treated in, in our school system? Well, we have a, um, the board has a policy on restraint. You all know about that. We all know about that. Mm -hmm. um, we have people who are trained. Meredith is the trainer. Um, so we have a significant number of staff who are trained in how to 
work with a young person who's out of control, how to manage that, how to escort them to a safe place. Um, that doesn't mean that it's going to manage the noise level. It probably won't. Um, and it may not manage the disruption, quite frankly. There will be disruption as someone is escorted down the hall to a quieter place. Um, each school has a variety of opportunities depending on the spaces. No school has the deluxe model of separate places that can just be um, available for maybe if you need it kind of space. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard about the space that was developed at Pong Cove first for the English language learners and then there was a lot of movement over there because a young person really needed a quiet little space to be. Um, and so they managed to pull that off. But um, we are no longer using what used to be the carpeted walled, um, I think they were called timeout rooms maybe when I got here. Um, there is one at the high school. It's used more now as a lounge with some soft furniture in there for quiet time <coughs> if someone needs to be there, but the door is always open. Um, the middle school does not use theirs and the well, in the elementary school, we removed the carpet off the wall. Okay. I, Barbara has tons oh, of questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just because I, you can't see yeah. her angle. Okay. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Susan. Nope. It's just that we're like, we're being very patient. Yeah, you are. You are sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got this. That's right. Yep. Um, your explanations are helpful and I appreciate that. I, I guess I have first an overarching sort of feeling about this and then some specific concerns um, because unlike a bunch of people at this table, I've held several of the roles you hold and I have a sense of what we're being asked to accommodate here. So um, I guess my, my biggest concern overarching is uh, an ask to have the, the leader of instructional support cut to half time in a, frankly, a time of turmoil. There's, you know, your explanations are terrific and I get them at an academic level. But I think what we're hearing from parents, and from the moment I started to campaign, I heard loudly from parents and staff as well, who are town residents who happen to bump into me, is that this isn't working as smoothly as as the words would describe. And I think the parents who um, took the time to come tonight and speak to that are extraordinarily frustrated that they're feeling that um, needs are being unmet. And whether it's, it's actual or whatever, perceptions are what they are. And I'm a big believer in paying attention to perceptions. So my worry overarching is this is not the time to have our instructional support director go to half time when there are some some pretty loud there's some pretty loud noise about things needing attention. So that's sort of my overarching concern about it. Um, underneath that I would say um, that certainly the, the the loss of the behavior behaviorist, whatever Ms. Croft's position was, has has had a serious impact from what I understand from parents and teachers on the ability to respond to kids in crisis, on the ability to provide appropriate consultation services, and that teachers are being pulled away from their uh, normal teaching duties in order to, to attend to kids who are having meltdowns, and that it's happening in public places, and that that's not a um, helpful thing for kids to have that sense of, of the whole world watching a meltdown. Whereas if there was a behaviorist K-8 within that large building, there would be a person whose, whose job it was. That's what I'm very used to in all my years as, as principal and, and curriculum director and assistant superintendent and superintendent. There were people, and I worked in very progressive districts, who believed strongly in having behavior strategists as part of these teams, whose job was to really keep kids integrated in their classrooms as best possible, provide support to the teachers, offer preventative services, but be that person when the child really is in crisis. Huge, huge issue for me. I think I'm concerned on behalf of folks. I've been to many, many, many hundreds of IEP meetings, and I have been, as a principal, 
and as a superintendent, very happy to have a director sitting there um, when, when there can, you know, when there are advocates at the table, when there's some pretty strong demands being made about services, when we're being asked to confirm a certain level of services that we're not positive we should have to do. I think there's a huge level of confidence having a director present for, for a lot of those uh, meetings, so I worry about that. Um, I'm worried about, I, I have also, as both a superintendent and a, and a um, principal, done collaborative evaluations with my special ed director around staff in the buildings, and I agree with that. The thing that hasn't been tried out here yet is this Kim Marshall model, which we had in Falmouth for two years, is, is very demanding, and um, in, in some ways, crushingly demanding until you sort of get some systems in place for the 10 or so to 15 walkthroughs per teacher, whether they're being evaluated or not, the walkthroughs don't stop. They're not supposed to. It's supposed to be an ongoing thing. <coughs> so for any of our principals to walk in and do brief feedback sessions with special ed staff is absolutely appropriate. For them to write the evaluation on top of everything else, ultimately, in my book, is too much. So, so I worry about that shift of responsibility um, and, and until you've really gotten uh, your model under underway in this district. And finally, I'd say the communication concerns that a couple parents have voiced, I think, needs improvement as well. And I worry there with someone only attending to those things half time could, could suffer further. I'm talking about some of the staffing changes that happened that were surprises to people. I'm talking about last year's budget called for three speech therapists and suddenly there were four without any sort of public transparency about that. Uh, I, I was at that meeting, I didn't raise my hand because I was new to that process, but I was surprised there was an explanation at the time. So I think overall, things aren't as, um, as cleanly smooth as 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 your as your hope and dream are, and that's frontline teacher feedback, that's parent feedback, and I just think giving this whole area less attention next year than it has now is uh, not adding value to the position or what the district needs. So there's not a lot of questions embedded in there. It's more like I'm really thinking about this and worrying seriously about the impact of, of your position going to have and about some of these other issues not getting the attention that they deserve. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to encapsulate that in some clearer questions so you can respond. But that I just, I just have to say that publicly. That's a deep concern for me. Thank you. I was going to um, say that asking for the affirmative action rule, I would think that it would be a positive for our district, um, for the teachers here, for you to step out of that role and for, for an, not an administrator to step out of that role. The human, human mm -hmm. resource support person to do that for um, a number of reasons. But um, So I like that move. I also like to move that um, I believe that yes, teacher evaluation is going on, and you're so right. Um, Kim Marshall is intense, but what we've learned, he's less intense than the other evaluation models. So, um, but that's Wait ongoing. Wait till you live it. Yeah, Wait I, you oh, live I know, it. I know. It's <laughs> ongoing, and I'm just one uh, person in that committee. Um, but I like the fact that administrators know all of our students. I like that um, special ed director and administrators are interchangeable in that process. What I was going to ask, already administrators are going to IEPs. Is that true? Mm -hmm. And so that's a regular practice, which I would think for the whole environment, teachers um, knowing all kids, administrators knowing all kids, we're not seg segregated, but we're one unit, which is what, uh, what we uh, before. And you guys have Jane Sell, if there is issues, and now we have Ruth Ellen's Sell, if we have mm -hmm. issues. Um, are we going to ask, can we Skype in IEPs yet, or not yet? Oh, we try not to do that. Yeah, okay, so it's not a practice yet. Okay, okay, I was just checking on that. Um, 
But, and then we have, when you said, like Cheryl's position, um, sorry Cheryl, to point you out, um, she does the administration, the paperwork piece of it. Is it I mean, they, I, I heard that the um, special, each special teacher gets 10, has 10 or so, seven to, ten, you know, average 10 um, students. But for the big, heavy um, paperwork and the callbacks and the meeting plans and the timing and the, that piece of it, is that the teacher who's managing that job? Pieces of it. Cheryl's no job is not to do everyone's paperwork for them, but she certainly is a great coach and um, a great facilitator of IEP meetings. She, as I do, both of us are happy to write the notes for people. That's a very time-consuming piece of what happens at IEP meetings. Um, but teams, teams should be collaborating on how to write IEPs um, and to put them together. It is not one sole person's job to write an IEP for the OT and the speech and language person and everybody else. They should collaborate on that. And that hasn't been as much the practice as it needs to be. Yeah, and so this is... Um there are changes. Um, you've been here three and a half years, and that that change is just happening this year. Is that what you said? It's um, a change that we've been working on, but it's happening more this year. But it's certainly got a long way to go. Okay. And then the one other piece I wanted to ask you was: When was the last time there was an um, for like an affirmative action? If there's two to three a year, how are we doing on those? I know we can't hear anything about that, but. This two or three year, did we have um, that many beforehand? Is this an increase or a decrease? And how are we know. doing on, because um, when you go in to check in the firm of the action, you're checking on all these pieces. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're doing a due diligence, is what I'm asking. Our, I know we're going to take every conversation, that every uh, in, all information that a parent says and check on it, because I know that's our practice or um, I'm assuming that is our practice. When we've received reports, they've been investigated and passed on, and sometimes those wind up being passed on outside for a variety of reasons. Typically, we try to handle them internally as best we can. Other administrators are typically involved in those investigations in some fashion. I, I, I'm aware of several, uh, at least two, in recent memory that have been conducted this year. I mean, that's fairly typical in my experience. Um, again, sometimes those are student to student, sometimes those are staff students, sometimes those are staff staff, um, but, but I don't see it as being any different than other places I've worked. Are you asking more for <coughs> what, how much time is involved? No, I'm really, I, I guess I'm really asking for so I don't want anything, um, there's no seat, you know, if there's an issue, let's address the issue. If there's, you know, if we, as that's the, said, that's the law. That's the law. Exactly. Yeah. Are we compliant with the law, I guess is the, the question I have. And do all parents know, I agree, and all teachers know if there is an issue, a uh, discrepancy, the process? That they go so our affirmative action policies, per se, are part of our policy handbook. They're included in student handbooks. Uh, if you're asking specifically about that, they're all included. If you're asking about IEP process? Well, yeah, it's, you know, hearing that there's, um, not, not, there's phone calls that aren't being returned, is that part of the IEP process? Different. Is that part of... Um, right, it's separate from affirmative action. That would be part essentially part of the IEP process. If there's a concern that services aren't being provided, I would expect that those would be brought to the team and from the team to include an appropriate administrator, be that the building administrator or the director of instructional support so that those concerns can be addressed. Okay. I, the, you know, I just want to, I so, know what Barbara's saying, but I also want to check, I know where in Flux I lived, um, I was here, when we've made these shifts, and I understand it's a difference in, and change is hard, and people's uh, students are the main focus. So, um, okay. I, <clears throat> I know it's running late, but um, you know, I just looking at um, you know, director of instructional support, the savings or whatever you want to call it, the decline would be thirty six thousand two hundred and thirty five dollars. And, you know, so that, that would be one, you know, benefit 
if you look at it that way. But if I weigh that against, you know, the complexity, the issues that there's been some philosophical transition. There's obviously needs that, um, you know, uh, we're, we're of course we're trying to meet all student needs, but could we do better? Absolutely. So I just look at that's thirty six thousand dollars in savings, and then what are the potential costs? I mean, if it went fantastic, you know, we could say, well, we saved thirty six thousand dollars, but we don't know. Um, so my, you know, during transition, one might argue, well, let's see how um, some of these responsibilities, you can still transition them, but one could argue you could do that while you have a full-time director. So if it works, it works. If it doesn't, all right, we're no better or worse than we were before. And, you know, it's always... You know, I apologize. I wish I knew more about special education, but you know, ever since I've been on the board, and you know, this is a complicated area, and I just wonder. Yeah, we have the thirty-six thousand dollars in savings, but all these areas that you know we always want to do better. You know, who's going to catch all those, um, given the workload of the building principal? So I just think um, it's an area. A decision, you know, you, you know, we, you know, there's some follow-up questions I have, and I'm sure others have, but I really struggle, you know, I, yeah, thirty-six thousand, thirty-six thousand, but there's a lot of work to be done um, on that. Um, I'm mindful of, of the time, um, you know, um, I, you know, it would be helpful maybe for the uh, the board to. If you have questions now or if you want to forward those to me on some follow-up just you know it'd be great to get comparables for peers on caseloads and then I know this is hard but you know uh, you know 20 kids who need help you know uh, with some basic speech might is totally different than 20 kids who have more severe needs so I'm you know the, the numbers if there's any way you could help us understand, you know, the, you know, 150 kids versus 150 kids, if, um, you know, if your mix is higher severity issues, just to help us understand, um, you know, how we should look at, um, you know, why 155 to 153, you know, may be different. So. Um, can I just comment on that? Yeah. That really it's going from 165, which was our projected number last year when we budgeted, to 153. So that's a difference of 12 students year to year. Okay. So I'm just trying to think of next steps. So, you know, I'm, Joe. Just a, a real quick question, and I'm sorry I'm tired, so I hope I remember what it was I was going to ask. But um, just in an overall philosophical question, are are you making these proposals in changes in your staffing responsibilities to save the $36,000? Or do you philosophically feel that the pieces that you are proposing to peel off and give to HR and the Director of Instructional Support are a better fit for those two positions? And will these changes indeed impact a teacher's day-to-day -day workload? Philosophically, I believe that e English language learners and gifted and talented are very well suited by the director of instruction, and I believe that affirmative action is well served by HR. Um, I feel that we have a, a separate the director conversation. I feel that we have um, wonderful staff to student ratios, and. Um, the director is proposed because it made a difference in the budget and I, if this is a proposal to you and you're making right. the ultimate decision and I give you I give I understand it's very difficult and I could argue for a hundred percent this way and I can argue a hundred percent this way um, I, if a team is not going to work together and support something then it won't work and um, if a team is going to work together and support a part-time director, 
um, it will work. It's not. I, I can't answer you, Joe, about what will a teacher see differently day to day. Um, because it, would, it depends on the need at the moment. There are some teachers that, that don't have a need to see a director very often. There are others who need to see one almost every day and for a variety of reasons. Um, there are moms and dads that I can have meetings after meetings after meetings with and we can agree today that things are good and tomorrow they're going to call you and tell you they're not. And so that just is the human nature of the position and the work. Um, and so I can I can I don't know how to predict that for you. Thank you. Could I just ask a, a question um, of, of <laughs> Kelly? Just I'm curious what your your uh, your feeling is. You know, pro projecting into the future if this budget passed as presented, um, whether or not you can you have a sense of the the climate. The impact of climate at at Pong Cove might be like. Do you do you feel confident that it could be managed in the way that you know as, as a team um, success, successfully? And not to put you on the spot, I'm just curious of your feelings. Going from a full-time director of special education to that time. Yeah. Um, I think that it would be I do have concerns about the transition in terms of, for us as administrators, transitioning to a new supervision evaluation model and knowing, and you're on the committee, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and I know we're still not done with the work, but knowing, um, <coughs> knowing just the current demands we have anyway, even with like probation, getting probation and staff mm -hmm. evaluated, and the evaluation is done. Um, and that's with two administrators doing it. It still is with our coordinating our other things and really doing it well. Really, mm -hmm. really not just like checking this off and going in. Right, and right. So I think um, that you had asked about climate. I, I think it's more. I, I think everyone would want to know just really transparency. Of what roles and responsibilities are? What's it going to look? You know, just different scenarios. I think would be helpful. What if? Um, you know, there, there was a high needs thing, and um, Kate, I think you asked what kind of sky thing, you know, what would, you know, how would, how would that look? I, I guess more of a specific question would be, um, you know, the, we have the increase in literacy specialists, and we have a full-time OT, I believe, um, uh, but how the Pong Cove in particular, just because this is this is the time, you know, the age where this is really intense, and I've been through the whole special ed system myself as a parent, um, where uh, behavior strategists, or behavior, someone who focuses on behavioral interventions, can really be useful at this level. And do do you fear, or do do you have a sense that there's fear amongst staff? that that is not well supported currently or possibly the in the future. Strategies. Um, I know when I spoke before about, you would ask me about the broad language, and I said, I've had, um, we have had discussions about that. I, I would say the behavior strategies is, is probably the hardest one for me to swallow in terms of us not have, we, we do fill a huge void there. Um, not because not everyone is working really, really hard, um, but um, in terms of how the impact that it can have on, and we have, you know, students, it, and you, you coined it well, I think we are at that level where it's early intervention, and it's not just 
sometimes it does feel without without a behavior strategist on staff, sometimes we feel more in a reactive mode at times, mm -hmm. more than a proactive mode when we've had a, a full-time um, behavior strategist because the strategist um, doesn't just, and it isn't about just working directly with the student, it's about working directly with staff and helping them almost that gradual release of responsibility with Having help, helping a team work together by helping a classroom teacher to, so that student can be successful in the least restrictive environment. More, but that that strategist has a real skill, and mm -hmm. it's not that right. it's not that our other specialists don't have those skills. Uh, well, I mean, they don't. I mean, they they don't have good skills. It's just that strategist role um, is it can be a little pivotal pivotal role, and it's unpredictable, not just with if a student is coming in that's new, but also some you know, students who do really well, and then sometimes they take dips, you know, and because of something that's, um, you know, occurred in their life, <coughs> or just because, you know, something is up with them, we, we can't, mm -hmm. um, we, we can't manage in terms of um, coordinating that um, plan as as tightly as we'd like to, if it were, if we had the consistency of someone that can be in and out, have relationships with this, with particular students and with also with particular staff a little bit over time. I think we've been fortunate to have some really strong consultants, but they're not here all the time. And when we have someone on staff all the time, it's um, things things run well. I mean, the, the contrast between I think, you know, when we have when we didn't. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So just to be clear, we're not suggesting that this budget doesn't propose a reduction in the behavior strategist positions. We still have a psychologist and a BSC. And the psychologist is the BCBA. So, and that's not changing. We're not. And the only reason why there's been a reduction in the staff is the current one is not changing. Correct. Correct. Okay. But the loss of Sonia. And Right. Yeah. The loss of Sonia, and then the other the other thing as well, far as Sonia behaviors. Can, can I make a suggestion? Um, we've had a lot of questions from the audience. Um, I would like to see um, Barbara put her um, expertise into listing some questions and then get some specific answers. We have. I mean, I, this is just muddled to me. And your answers. Some of these answers are a, a bit muddled, and it's kind of hard to follow. It. If we had very specific questions, behavioral strategists, do we, you know, do we, uh, do we still um, support that? Do we still have enough people here to handle that issue? Do we have, um, you know, how you transition your? I guess what I'm saying, we have a series of questions from the audience and uh, from here, and if somebody could put them in question form and have you answer them, then we'd be a lot further along. Thank you. And my suggestion was um, that school board members forward questions to actually be easier, just forward them to Meredith. Um, and then uh, we don't want to have those responses in email. So forward the questions, and then our next budget workshop, we'll pick up where we left off, and that way those questions would be answered in a public setting. Um, you know, I'm not sure if Michael was taking good notes, but we have a tape, and if there are issues that are raised, and okay, you did. Let's get them all answered. I think that'd be the easiest thing. It'd be easier for me to understand, anyways. So it's uh, almost 10. Oh gosh, it's almost 10:30. Um, so we'll wrap it up. Uh, we'll update the other budget workshop meetings for the next item. Um, March it's March 17th, and if we add more budget workshops, that will be uh, updated on the budget calendar as well. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.